Hey guys and welcome back. So now we've come to the part of this course where we're going to be talking about the concept of networking. Now networking is an absolutely massive subject in the world of IT of course because it is the technologies within the realm of networking that allows us to have something like say the internet. Now as Linux engineers we certainly do need to have an understanding of the different technologies within our networks as well as how networks actually talk to each other. Now the good news is is that this is not going to be a networking certification so we don't have to understand the concept of networking at an expert level. What we want to be focusing on instead are the fundamentals of networking. And there are a few fundamentals to go through, like I say, the topic of networking is a huge one. But some of the things that we will want to understand are the different layers within networking. Now we'll talk about this in a little bit more depth in the following nuggets within this skill. But understand the way networking has been modelled conceptually, well there are two different ways so to speak. The first one is the OSI model. This is a super famous model within networking and ultimately it is comprised of seven different layers. So the layers involved in the OSI model, very briefly I'll just say, we have the application layer, the presentation layer, then the session layer, the transport layer, then the network layer and then one called the data layer link layer and then lastly we have the physical layer. Now we will talk about what these layers are and what they do in the upcoming nuggets but understand that this is just one representation to represent telecommunication systems. Now the same concepts have been simplified and in some cases I should say aggregated together in what is called the TCIP model. Now with the TCP IP model we only have four layers, like I say, it's more simplified and greatly abstracted. So, the top layer, we still have the application layer, and then we jump to the transport layer, and then the network layer, sometimes known as the internet layer, and then the network access layer. And again, just as we said with respect to the OSI model, we will be covering these different layers conceptually in the upcoming nuggets. I just want you to be aware that we do have these two distinct reference models to model our networking concepts. But don't worry, I will show you where the overlap is when we're going through each one, one by one. So throughout this course so far, we have made reference to things such as IP addresses. We've even used tools such as ping to verify connectivity. So much of what we're doing here is deeply rooted in the concept of networking and this is what we're really going to be further exploring within this skill and some of the upcoming skills so that by the end of this course you're not just going to be proficient in typing in some Linux commands, you will also understand the underlying protocols that tie so many of these systems together and it really will help you manage your networks when you do understand IP addressing a little bit better and you do understand MAC addresses a little bit better. So much of what we have to do as Linux engineers actually does revolve around these networking concepts so actually getting the fundamentals straight in your head is really going to pay massive dividends for you. Okay doc so that is us for our introduction into what we're going to be doing. The very first thing that I want to talk to you about is that network access layer we talked about in the TCP IP model. Now this also relates to the OSI model, but what exactly is the relation? Well that's what we're going to be finding out in the very next nugget. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hey guys and welcome back. So as we learned within the previous nugget, we talked about the different types of models that we could use to represent our telecommunication systems. We know we have the OSI model which has seven layers 
and we know we have the more modern version which is the TCP IP model which only has four. Now the reality is there is a great overlap here and let me just explain briefly what this overlap looks like. So like I say in the OSI model we had the application layer, I'll just shorten that to the word app, we had the presentation layer and the session layer, this was how this was described within the OSI. Now this actually maps just to a single layer within the TCPI model just called the application layer, okay? So really quite straightforward. Similarly, in the OSI model, we had the transport layer, and this actually maps directly to the transport layer within TCP IP. So these two are pretty much the same, no change there at all. Now in the OSI model, we had the network layer, and this is known in the TCP IP model as either the network layer or sometimes more commonly, just the internet layer. Now the one which I really want to focus in on in this skill right here are the two layers in the OSI model known as the data link layer and the physical layer. And let me just spell physical correctly, that would be helpful. <laughs> okay, so data link and physical, they basically combine and aggregate. They become the network access layer within TCP IP. So what I want to do in this nugget right here is to talk about these two individual layers, the data link layer and the physical layer, and then just make a mental note that what we learn about these two layers ultimately falls under the banner of the network access layer within TCP IP. So let's start with the lowest layer first, and that is the physical layer. So let's begin discussing it then, shall we? So when we actually discuss the physical layer, and I keep misspelling that, I don't know why, I don't know why I keep doing this. The physical layer, what we're talking about is ultimately the transmission of bits, and it's the transmission of bits over the network, and also describing the physical nature of the medium being used. Okay, so that might sound a little bit confusing, what on earth are we talking about here? Well, first, when we're talking about bits, what I'm really talking about is binary data. You know the way you can have bits and bytes in computing. What we're talking about here is bits. So I'm not just using a vague term, this is actually a very specific term relating to the binary data we are transmitting. Now ultimately, this is going to be represented in zeros or ones, that type of thing. And this can be represented in different ways. Now we'll actually get to talk about bits in more detail in a later skill when we talk about IP addressing. This explicitly relates to this type of concept. But for now, just take a high level overview that we're talking about this binary data. But how are we sending this binary data? Well, when we talk about the physical layer, we could be talking about sending electrical voltage. Now, how would we actually transmit this electrical voltage? Well, we could transmit it over something like, say, copper wire. And this is what is happening when you're using your wired cables. If you happen to have an internet connection, with a cable connection using something like say ethernet, you are ultimately transmitting your data as electrical voltage over copper wire. And at its simplest level, this is being transmitted in the form of binary in zeros and ones. Now we know in the modern age, we actually have the option for some super fast connectivity. And this is when we have fiber optic connections now ultimately, this is not going to be relating to sending our signals, our binary data over metal wire using electrical voltage. Instead, we send the data as light and it's light being sent through these fiber optic cables. And it's because it is light based. This is why fiber optic is so fast. Now, you might be wondering how on earth do we actually represent binary data, something like this, i.e these bits, how do we actually represent that as electrical voltage or light? Well, if we're talking about, say, sending our data over the wire with electrical voltage, we can determine if we have a zero, if there is an absence of voltage, or if we have the presence of voltage, that can represent the binary value one. So really, our signal can be on and off. And in the exact same way with fiber optic, we can determine whether we are representing a binary one if we have the presence of light or the binary value zero if we have 
an absence of the light, the exact same concept. Now there are a whole bunch of other details with respect to the physical layer, things relating to say maybe wiring standards and different optimization strategies to actually improve the performance of these technologies. But the reality is we don't have to understand these things in such depth, really just understand what the purpose of the physical layer represents. It represents the physical medium and the transmission of binary bits over the network. Now the next layer up, again still part of the network access layer and the TCP IP model is the data link layer. So let's now discuss that. So when we're talking about the data link layer, the type of data we are transmitting is not called bits, instead they are called frames. Now if you happen to have any experience with something called network switches, you will know this term, but if you don't, just make a note of it. On the data link layer, we are transmitting frames. Now, when we happen to be transmitting our frames, we need to make sure that these frames do not exceed a particular size. And the size that they should not exceed is called the MTU. This is the maximum transmission unit. And the data link layer, well, one of its core features is to ensure that frames do not do this so that they do stay within the maximum transmission unit and therefore can be transmitted over the network. Now another thing that is related to the data link layer is probably something you have heard about before. It's actually related to uniquely finding physical devices on the network via their MAC address. This is exactly what we mean when we talk about the data link layer. Now the way we can communicate in networking terms is using something called a network switch. And this is going to allow us to transmit frames across our local network. So let's imagine we've got a server here, let's just call this server one, connected to the switch. And then we have server two, connected to the switch, and server three. If server one wants to talk to server three, Ultimately, server one has to send a frame to server three's physical address, i.e. we send a frame to that MAC address. And this type of action is referred to as data link communication. Now, with respect to the data link layer, not only does it handle frames and ensure those frames do not go above the maximum transmission units, the data link layer is also responsible for performing error detection and correction. Now for the purposes of the LPIC1 examination, I honestly can't really see you having to know the real details of how this is performed. If you are curious, you can read about checksums within the data link layer, but honestly, I would just really focus on the fact that the data link layer can perform error detection. So if we have errors, the data link layer can detect these and correct for it. So what we have discussed right here, when we talked about frames at the data link layer, or if we're talking about actual binary bits on the wire, whether it's the data link layer in the case of frames or the physical layer in the case of bits, frames and bits together ultimately all fall under the network access layer in our new terminology the TCP IP model. So understand the idea of handling MAC addresses would be a data link technology, whereas dealing with wires or fiber optics, that would be a physical layer technology. Again, both of these technologies fall under the network access layer in our new model. And again, just to stress, there is nothing practical going on here with the OSI model or the TCP IP model. These are conceptual theories to help us understand what is going on. But despite this, it really is important that we understand that we do have these two different models and where the crossover lies, because depending on the question you may be asked, you may have to give a slightly different answer depending on if the question asks something relating to the OSI representation or the TCP IP representation. So that really is us for our introduction into the network access layer, which again covers the data link and the physical layer. The next layer we want to talk about is that internet layer, otherwise known in the OSI model as the network layer. This one is a big one. So how about we dive right on in and well, that's what we're going to be doing in the very next nugget. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.
Hey guys and welcome back. So in the previous nugget we had talked about the network access layer within the TCP IP model. Now what we're going to talk about is the internet layer. So this is a term commonly used within TCP IP but it does directly map to what was called the network layer within the OSI model. Now this layer here is responsible for a lot of action going on, so let's not waste any time and dive right in then shall we. So the primary purpose of this internet layer, or the network layer, as it's otherwise known, is that it is mainly concerned with forwarding data based on logical addresses. So what on earth am I talking about when I mean a logical address? Well, in the previous nugget, we talked about how at the data link layer, we had physical addresses. These related to MAC addresses. And these are the addresses which are burnt in to the physical device itself. Now, when we talk about logical addresses, what we are ultimately talking about are IP addresses. Now, like I say, I'm not going to really dive into the details of IP addressing quite just yet. We'll get to that in the very next skill. But understand that this is what we're talking about when we mean the network layer or the internet layer were pushing packets towards particular IP addresses. And like I say, this is referred to as our logical addresses. Now, when we talk about our network layer, one of the main responsibilities is about root discovery. Because quite simply, we want to be able to talk to remote networks. Say for example, that you wanted to access Netflix. How are you able to access Netflix's network so that you can enjoy the services which are on their servers? Well, ultimately, you might have your little computer right here and you're connected to your home router. Now, how does that information transmit all the way across the world to a completely different network of servers? Well, ultimately, what your little router is doing it's allowing you to connect to different networks. Now, typically, what is going to be happening here is that your little home router is not going to be doing much by way of any root calculation. It's going to have what is called a default route. Now, what that default route will do, it will take any traffic that is defined for a remote network, i.e. a network which is not your own, and it will just send it to your local ISP. Now within your ISP, they actually have a very large and complex network and within that network, they will be running something called a routing protocol. Now this is how we can actually discover remote networks. Now again, we don't have to really understand the details of the different routing protocols such as OSPF or things like BGP, but just know that these routing protocols allow us to discover remote networks. So really, you and your home Whenever you have a web address, say for example, going to Netflix, we have already learned about the concept of DNS, which ultimately resolves the name Netflix.com to a particular IP address. Let's just say 8.8.8.8, even though that is not the IP address for Netflix. What happens is when your router sees that this network is not on the local network which you are on, it can just forward that traffic directly to the ISP. And then, like I say, your ISP can do all of this complex root discovery at the internet or the network layer. Now, we actually mentioned the concept of bits for our data at the physical layer and frames when we're talking about MAC addresses at the data link layer. When we're talking about the network layer or the internet layer, we're talking about packets. Now, you may have actually heard this term before. It's quite well known. So if we're talking about packets, you know we're talking about the internet layer or the network layer. And this is sending packets targeted with a source IP address, i.e. the IP address of where the packet came from and the destination IP address, i.e. where does the packet want to go. And this is fundamentally how basic communication works. So let's say you have a local network, okay? This may be your home laptop, and let's maybe say your router in the house. Hey, let's maybe even add in a printer that you may have. Now, if all of these are on the same local network, and we'll actually discuss what it means to have a local network with respect to when we discuss IP addressing, but just understand we can have this concept of being on the same network, which is what we have here, 
The devices in here, i.e. the laptop, the router and the printer, they actually communicate together, not using the logical address, but instead using that physical address, i.e. they're basically talking to each other using their MAC addresses. So that means this is the domain of the data link layer. However, when we want to talk to remote networks, we actually have to move up a layer. So again, we could have our little network here of our laptop, our router and our printer. And if we want to talk to Netflix, which is a remote network, we ultimately have to involve IP addresses, which is what happens, like I say, when you go to your browser, type in netflix.com, your DNS gets the IP address from the name netflix.com and you can begin that request. And like I say, you maybe send it to your ISP and then they can get that information to the Netflix server and bring all that information back to you. And again, we will definitely clarify what it means to be a local network or a remote network when we talk about IP addressing and subnets. But really for now, just understand that when we're talking about layer three, we're talking about logical addressing, which is basically IP addresses. And this allows us to talk to remote networks. Also understand that in order to be able to find these remote networks, part of what makes up the internet layer or the network layer is that concept of root discovery which can be found using things such as routing protocols. Now, once again, this is not a networking certification, so we don't have to dive into the details of these types of protocols, which we can use, but it would be helpful to just understand that these routing protocols can aid the discovery of these remote networks so that we can actually have such communication. So that really is the primary focus of the internet layer or the network layer, if you do prefer. We still have more layers to talk about when we are discussing our communication. The next one we're going to talk about is that transport layer. This one is very, very important. And that's what we're talking about in the very next nugget. So I hope this has been informative for you. And I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hey guys, and welcome back. So in the previous nugget, we had just talked about the network layer, otherwise known as the internet layer. We're now going to talk about the transport layer, which is referred to by the same name in the TCP IP model, just as it is within the OSI model. So really, really easy one to remember. Now the transport layer is sometimes referred to as a kind of segue or a dividing line, so to speak, between what are known as the upper layers, which deal with the actual applications, and the lower layers, such as the internet layer and the network access layer. Now, when it comes to the transport layer, there are two very, very common protocols in action. The first one is called TCP, and the second one is called UDP. Now TCP stands for Transmission Control Protocol and UDP is User Datagram Protocol. So let's first talk about TCP then. So TCP is what is referred to as a connection oriented protocol. Now the big thing about TCP is that the connection is going to be reliable. So what on earth do I mean when I say reliable? Well imagine this. So let me show you the basic connection. Let's say we had a sender here. This could be a computer and a destination server. If we were going to establish a connection between these two devices using TCP, what would happen would be an establishment of something called a three-way handshake. Now all this handshake does, it's just kind of like a negotiation. And the negotiation is to make sure that both the sender and the receiver, i.e. the destination, are on the same page and synchronized together. So think about it. Here's how this is going to look. Sender here is going to send a message to the destination and this is going to be a SYN. And this is really to ultimately synchronize the connection. Now the destination is going to send its own SYN back, but it's going to send what is called a SYN ACK. This is ultimately a SYN message and acknowledging that the destination received the original SYN message. And then the sender will complete the three-way handshake by sending an ACK of its own to acknowledge to the destination that, by the way, I also got your message here. And now 
the connection can be synchronized and established. Now, before we go on any further, what I will mention is that remember we had bits for the physical layer and we had frames for the data link layer and we also had packets for the network layer. When we're talking about the transport layer, we're talking about segments. That is the unit of data at this layer right here. So with that in mind, when we want to transfer segments between a sender and a receiver, when we use TCP, there actually is a concept known as windowing. So the way windowing actually works, it means that the sender can send segments to the destination with increasing increments. So what do I mean when I say this? Well, on the first window, the sender could send one segment to the receiver and then the receiver could say, hey, I acknowledge that. I happen to receive that segment that you sent. So the sender now knows, hey, okay, that's good. What I sent was received. I am aware of this. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the window size, which would mean that the sender here, and again, the destination, the window would be bigger. So the sender would send segment number two and then segment number three. Now, as opposed to having to wait on an acknowledgement for every single segment, the destination can just acknowledge, hey, I got the last two that you just sent. So the destination does not have to send an ACK for every single segment that was sent, and this can just keep on increasing. So the next time, the window would get bigger. The sender this time, could send four segments to the destination. So we're getting more efficient as the window grows larger. And if those four segments were received, the destination would let the sender know with an acknowledgement. And this keeps increasing until the sender does not actually receive that ACK from the destination, in which case the window size would reduce once again. So pretty much we go back to what we were doing. We can send one again and then wait for the ACK and then we can send two, and then wait for the ACK, and then keep building this back up, expanding the window again until we fail to receive that acknowledgement from the destination, whereby we shrink the window size once again. So the cool thing about TCP here is that we get a ton of reliability. So the sender can send something to the destination and know that that information was received. If that segment was not received, then the sender could retransmit that segment to make sure it gets to the destination. And again, it knows that when we get that ACK message back. So really, when we talk about TCP, we really are focusing on reliability. Now we can see this is very good when we want to have reliable connections. Maybe we want to do some type of transfer from our local computer to a remote server, and we're transferring that data. We want to make sure that that data has been transferred reliably and nothing has been skipped or missed. In this case, TCP would be a very good choice. Now, the other one we have, which we talked about, is UDP, User Datagram Protocol. This is kind of like the opposite in that UDP is what is known as unreliable and ultimately it is primed for speed and performance. So here is the difference when it comes to using UDP. We could have the sender and the receiver. Now, when we use UDP, the sender is just going to begin sending those segments to the receiver and the receiver or the destination, if you rather, to keep it the same format, the destination is never going to let the sender know whether or not the segments were successfully received. We're getting no feedback here, okay? So clearly we're going to get a great reduction in reliability. Say for example, this segment here might not have made it and the sender will not know to retransmit this. It will just keep firing the rest of the segments. But this does mean that we have less overhead and there is a speed performance. So when we happen to use things like real-time communication, such as a voice over IP video call, you may notice that when you happen to have your connection, maybe the person you're talking to, 
maybe every few minutes the picture might get temporarily blurred. That is because there is some missing segments that were not actually received, nor were they retransmitted because this is a real-time communication. Sending them retroactively after the fact isn't really going to do as much good. Instead, we want to have fast performance. Therefore, we would choose UDP. So again, less reliable, but there are absolutely use cases for UDP. So like I say, real-time streaming, voice and video, a big candidate for this is UDP. Now, whilst the main two protocols at this layer are TCP and UDP, we actually also have other protocols we can use at this layer. And here is one that you probably already have seen before. This is called ICMP. This is the Internet Control Message Protocol, and this is actually the protocol we use when we use our ping command. So say, for example, I go onto my terminal here, and I say ping 8.8.8.8. What we're actually invoking here is ICMP, and like I say, this is also at the transport layer. Now, when it comes to troubleshooting our networks, we have seen the ping command, but we'll also get to talk about the command traceroute. Now, this also happens to use ICMP, the Internet Control Message Protocol, at the transport layer. Now, another very important concept about the transport layer is that this is actually the layer where the TCP IP ports listen. So, you might not be aware, but when you happen to use a web browser and you're using HTTPS, you're not just sending a request to the IP address of the web server, you are actually sending it over a particular port and that port is 443. This part of the communication, i.e. this port number, is ultimately defined at the transport layer. Whereas if we are not using HTTPS, and we're just using regular HTTP, i.e. the unencrypted version, that request would be sent over port 80, a different number. Now, we'll actually get to talk about ports in a little bit more detail later on within this very skill. But for right now, just understand that this is the layer where these ports are listening. But for now, that is us for our introduction into the transport layer. The next layer we want to talk about is the application layer, and that is what we're going to be talking about in the very next Nuggets. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hey guys, and welcome back. So in this Nugget, what I want to talk to you about is the application layer. Now this is what this layer is called when we use the TCP IP model, but if you do recall, when we talk about the OSI model, this is actually further broken down into three different layers. We have the session layer, the presentation layer, and the application layer. So what I want to do is to talk to you about these three different layers within the OSI model, whilst acknowledging they ultimately collapse together just under the heading application layer within TCP IP. But I do think it is beneficial to address these individuals from a conceptual standpoint. So let's first begin with the session layer. Now, the purpose of the session layer is that it's responsible for setting up a session. So that would be like checking users' credentials or giving each session flow a unique number to separate a particular session from another so that there is no confusion between what data goes where, as well as setting up the type of services needed during the session, as well as which device should actually begin sending data. Now, the session layer is also responsible for maintaining a session. So that would mean if some type of session happened to disconnect and drop, it would be the session layer's responsibility to ultimately repair and re-establish that disconnected session. Similarly, the session layer would be responsible for tearing down a session once it's over. Now, the next layer is going to be the presentation layer. Now, the primary function of the presentation layer is really all about how that data is going to be presented. That means we're going to handle the formatting of particular data. Say, for example, some text might use ASCII code. That information would have to be handled by the presentation layer. Now, not just data formatting, the presentation layer will also handle 
encryption. So if you happen to be sending some type of potentially sensitive data, that may be a password. If that data was not encrypted, it could ultimately be stolen and used by a malicious attacker. So in order to prevent this, we would actually want to wrap this data within some type of encryption. And again, this would be handled by the presentation layer. Now, when it comes to the actual application layer at the very top, so what the application layer does is that it actually provides services to a network. So if you wanted to be able to perhaps do some type of file sharing, well, the file sharing would be presented to the network via the application layer. Similarly, just to mirror what we talked about in a previous skill, we could also present email services to the network. And again, this would be presented to us via the application layer. Now, this layer is the layer closest to the end user, whereas the physical layer, as we learned, is the layer furthest away from the user. So basically we run through the stack. The application layer is layer seven. The presentation layer is layer six. The session layer is layer five. The transport layer is layer four. Layer three is the network layer. Layer two is data link. And layer one is the physical layer. And like I say, for the purposes of the TCP IP model, all of these top three layers are aggregated just into what is known as the application layer itself. So these are some of the key concepts around the very basic fundamentals of networking, understanding these stacks, understanding what happens at these particular layers can really help you understand your infrastructure and be able to troubleshoot issues on your network and your systems. This is why it's such a crucial part of the LPIC1 examination because what you actually do on your Linux system is going to be involving these layers at some level. So knowing these different levels will give you a very narrow focus of where you should put your attention to given a particular condition or problem. Now, previously we happened to mention when we talked about the transport layer that the transport layer actually dealt with ports. Now that we've actually went through the entire OSI model as well as the TCP IP stack, let's now drill in and focus on some of the common ports that we have to understand for the LPIC1 exam. And well, that's what we're going to be doing in the very next nugget. So I hope this has been informative for you. And I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hey guys, and welcome back. So previously we had mentioned the concept of ports within networking. Now what I want to do is to just take a little bit of time to expand upon this subject and talk about some of the common port numbers within use for typical services. And again, look at some relevant locations for port number configuration files. Okay, so let's dive in then, shall we? So the first thing I should say is that a port is a logical construct because when I first heard about ports I was thinking about the physical ports on my computer like a USB port or an HDMI port but those are physical ports so to speak what I'm talking about are logical ports meaning that they don't actually physically exist they are ultimately just numbers used to identify a specific process. Now these port numbers do follow a particular convention. Say for example, as I happen to mention, port 443 is typically used for HTTPS connections. Now what I will say is that this is not a hard construct. For example, the person operating this web server could actually configure to serve up HTTPS on a different port number, but the utility of having a well-known port number such as 443 for a particular service is that it just makes life easier. If you're going to try to make a connection to a web server, let's say the IP address was 8.8.8.8 and you wanted to make a web connection over HTTPS, you wouldn't have to guess and try to put in some random port number hoping you could get a successful connection you know if you send a request with port number 443, the service you're going to be getting is HTTPS. Now like I say, if the server, or rather the administrator of that server, happened to choose a different port number 
then this request to port number 443 would no longer work. But like I say, it does make life easier if we do have these well-known and common port number for particular services. Now this combination of what I just did there, i.e. an IP address, which is this part, and then the colon followed by a particular port number, let's just say port 25. This combination of an IP address and then the port, this together is known as a socket. And this concept of a socket is what we're using all the time when we're making particular requests. Because think about it, if we send a request to a server and we use port 443, we can get HTTPS services from this web server. However, if we happen to make a request to the same IP address, i.e. to the same server, but we use a different socket, i.e. we use a different port number, we could get a completely different service. In this case here, we could be making a DNS request from that same server, even though we are ultimately targeting the exact same server with the exact same IP address. So really, these port numbers allow us to cleanly separate different services, even if they're coming from the same IP address. It doesn't actually matter. We can still clearly delineate each process individually. So let me talk you through some of the common ports that you will see as a Linux administrator. So port 20 and port 21 those are the standard ports used for file transfer protocol. So FTP, this really is a standard communication protocol when you want to transfer files from let's say a computer all the way to a server or maybe download from a server back to the client. That transferring of the files, very often you'll be using FTP. Therefore, if the server had an IP address of 1111, the port numbers you would be using would be either port 20 or port 21. And again, just to reiterate, there is nothing stopping the server from actually changing these numbers for that particular service. But typically that is just going to add unnecessary confusion. So really, this is where you're going to be seeing FTP in action. Now another well-known one is for SSH. This is Secure Shell. And this is how we can log in to a remote server over an encrypted channel. If we want to log in via SSH, the standard port number will be port 22. Now we've actually seen SSH before, and in fact, if I can just show you, this here is my Linux virtual machine. Let me just log in. And I go to my terminal, and I say IP adder. You can actually see here my IP address, 192.168.0.65. If I want to be able to log into this device using SSH, I can take this IP address, and what I'll do is I'll use my PuTTY client, and you can actually see what's going on here. You see that? Here is the IP address of that server, 192.168.0.65, and look at the port. I'm trying to connect over 22 for SSH. If I happen to put in the wrong port, say for example 28, and try to open the connection, it's not going to allow me to open that connection because SSH is not operating on that port. Instead, if I try again, this time with port 22, I open the connection, it now gives me a login page, I can type in my username and type in the password for IPv0, and now I have access to this system over an encrypted shell. So that is SSH. Now an older implementation to log in before we had SSH was the unencrypted version and that was Telnet. That actually uses port 23. It's pretty much the same as SSH in many ways. You can log in to servers and manage systems using this. But the problem is, is that this is pretty insecure because anyone who happens to be sniffing that traffic can actually see all of the commands you happen to be typing because the entire channel itself is unencrypted. So unencrypted, port 23, port 22, that will be encrypted. Now another very common one you will see is SMTP. We actually talked about this, I believe, in the previous skill. This is the simple mail transfer protocol. This is used for email. And the common port this is going to use is port number 25. So if you want to be using email services from a particular IP address, again, just use the favorite IP address of all the eights. Email services could be sent over port 25. This would be the socket for that. And again, at least as a default. Nothing, of course, to stop an administrator changing this. Now, we also have another very, very popular and important one. This is for DNS. We've talked about this. Now, DNS is going to operate over port 53. 
DNS, we know what this is. This is how we can get an IP address from a domain name. So this is obviously a very important service. Another super common one is just regular HTTP. This runs over port 80. This is ultimately the unencrypted version of the hypertext transfer protocol. And this is what you would be using when you browse websites that aren't actually using encryption. We have NTP, which we talked about earlier in a previous skill. That is going to be in port 123. So if we want to be sending a request to some type of server for NTP services, we can make that request over port 123 with whatever the IP address is, of course. And we could get our NTP services from that server. Next up, we have ports 161 and 162. This is for SNMP. This is the simple network management protocol. And this is a port used commonly by network engineers to manage and monitor the health of their network. Another common one is, you may know, 443. This is the secure version of our web browsing, HTTPS. And we also have port 465. For SMTP, S, this is ultimately the secure version of SMTP for email services, i.e. with encryption. And honestly, we actually have way, way, way more ports for way more services than that. But really, those are just the main ones, the most common ones you will see in use. But we can actually get a list of pretty much all of the ports. And we can find this in a very particular location. Now, I really want you to try to remember this location. This part is important. Even if you don't remember all of the port numbers and services we just talked about, try to remember this part. So if I say nano and I go into the Etsy directory and I pick out the services file, if I hit enter, check this out. This is our configuration file for our network services. Now, if we actually scroll on down, check this out, you can see things like FTP data port 20 and just regular FTP port 21. Now, one thing you might notice, and again, this relates back to what I talked about when I said port numbers are handled at the transport layer, is that you might notice that the port might be a TCP port or a UDP port. So we talked about this, how this actually impacts the way the connection is going to be with TCP. We will have that three-way handshake we will be using things like windowing and we will have reliability. Whereas UDP, we're just going to fire that data across with no reliability and no acknowledgements. So if we scroll on down, we can actually see so many of what we just talked about here. Say for example, SSH, that is using port 22 and it's using TCP. Whereas Telnet, that uses port 23, again, TCP. SMTP, port 25, TCP, and again, as you can see, we have all these other services that we haven't even talked about, just less commonly used ones. Now, what you might notice is that some services, such as SNMP, the Simple Network Management Protocol, that can operate using TCP over port 161, but it can also operate over UDP using port 61. Same type of deal when it comes to NetBIOS, it can use TCP and it also can use UDP. Now, if you want to make changes for particular services, you could actually go in and modify this file. But before you ever did such a thing, you really would have to have a particular use case and justification for doing so. Now, if I actually try to add some information here, you can see I have this error writing permission denied. This is, of course, that in order to modify this services file, you would have to have root super user privileges to do so. And no wonder, because this is obviously a very important file for our networking. So what I'll just do is I'll just exit and leave any changes unsaved. Now, one thing I want to show you is a very popular tool in action. This is called Nmap, and I will say yes. Now, what this tool is, is that it is a port scanner. What it will do, it will actually scan a particular computer based on an IP address or a network if you give a network address and it will look for all the open ports. So say for example, if it sees port 22 open, then it thinks, hey, this computer is accepting SSH connections. And this is exactly what hackers attempt to do when they want to breach a system. So what I can do here is I can say IP adder. I can see my IP address is 192.168.0.65. I will just run Nmap against my own computer. So I'll type in the IP address and hit enter. And notice here that the only port that happens to be open is port 22. 
And this makes sense because what I'm doing right now is I am logging in to this system over port 22. So this port does have to be open in order to facilitate that connection. So what I could also do is I could say sudo apt install and I'll just say Python 3. This is the Python programming language. So now what I'll do is I'll say sudo Python 3 m for module. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a little web server on my own system right now. And I'll bind it to the address of my IP address, which is 192.168.0.65. Now I could serve it up over port 80, but if I want to choose a different port number, like I say, I could happen to change it. I could just say something like say 9000 and hit enter. Now I'm actually serving a web server. So if I try to go to this address here, just copy you. So if I just go to my actual Windows system, open up Firefox, and I go and type in that address right here, and hit enter, look at this, it actually takes me to what is ultimately my Linux machine, which is being served over a web server, so I could click on, say for example, documents, now there is nothing in documents, so what I could do, is I'll go back to my Linux virtual machine, I'll go into the documents page, and I'll just say nano file test.txt, just say this as a test, save you, write it out. So now if I go back to my Windows machine and I refresh the page, now we have this file test.txt file. I can click this and we can open it just via a web browser. So clearly we can access HTTP services over a completely arbitrary port, in this case 9000. But if I wanted the world to use this port, then I wouldn't want them to have to guess that you have to access over port 9000. Instead, if I just happen to use port 80, then the web server by default would be able to find it no problem at all, as opposed to having it quote unquote hidden. And I try to reach over a random port, say for example this, I hit enter. Notice we do have a problem connecting. HTTP services are not being served over port 7678. Instead, I do have to reach it over the particular socket, in my case, port 9000 as specified. So really that is the concept of ports and sockets. Don't be too bogged down about trying to remember all of the port numbers for all of the different services. Just understand that we do have common port numbers used for common services, which makes them easy to find and keep things a lot neater. And also understand that particular services can be served over TCP ports or if we want, say for example, UDP ports. All of this is handled at the transport layer and we can actually modify our port and service configuration within that Etsy services file, which again requires super user privileges. Okay, doc, so that is us for our introduction into ports. I hope this has been informative for you. I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hey guys, and welcome back. So now what I want to talk to you about is the concept of IP addressing and talk to you about it in a little bit more detail. So IP addressing, I'm sure you know, is a big part of networking. It's a big part of being able to use the internet and communicate with different devices. But how does it actually work? And what was the idea behind its creation? Well, think about this then. Let's say you were a mailman and your job was to deliver a whole bunch of mail to a whole bunch of different people. How would you know how to get that letter through the correct letterbox? But well, we know we have some pretty useful information, such as your general address. Not just that, but you will also have, if you're in the United States, something called a zip code, whereas in the UK, we have something called a postcode, and I'm sure many other countries have their own form of such a concept. Now really, what these actually do is they help us narrow down where it is we want to go to. Say for example, you had some mail that said, you know, this is going to 12 Main Street. And you were a postman and you think, oh well there's a Main Street in maybe say Orlando, Florida. <laughs> there is a Main Street somewhere in Birmingham in the United Kingdom and a whole bunch of other places. So how would you know how to go to the correct main street? Well, like I say, in the United Kingdom, we could cut down the ambiguity here by specifying a particular postcode. Now what the postcode does, it allows you to take your map 
and it allows you to focus in on a very specific spot. Let's just say this little square here could be a part on the map. And within this little square, you would go there and then look for a street called Main Street. And then when you're on Main Street, you would go up to the house that was 12 Main Street and that would allow you, with all of this information, to triangulate the exact location that you want to go to. Makes sense, doesn't it? Well, similarly, on the internet, you can imagine just how big the internet happens to be. Now, if you imagine and think about all the different devices which are connected to the internet. Right now, we have billions of people in the world, many of whom are online, and many of whom have multiple devices. Maybe you have a mobile device which is connected to the internet, and maybe you have some type of smartwatch, and maybe you've got a home PC and also a laptop. Pretty much what I'm saying is that we may have billions and billions and billions of individual devices on the internet. So how exactly then do we route traffic to a very particular location given the space is so vast? Well, you might think the idea could be, well, we could just give one unique IP address to every device on the planet. And to be honest, this is kind of the more modern way of thinking. When we talk about IP version 6, we'll actually get to see how this solves some of these problems. But right now we have a concept that's still very prevalent, in fact probably still the most popular, and that is IPv4. Now the issue with IPv4 is that we have a very limited, at least by this time, a very limited amount of IP addresses. Simply put, we do not have near enough IP addresses within the IPv4 address space to give every single one or every single device a unique address. And quite honestly, not just this, the way networking actually works, the way devices actually talk to each other, they use things such as broadcasts. Now, we don't have to really understand too much about these type of networking concepts for the exam. But understand we do have these underlying problems. A broadcast would simply mean that if we happen to look back at my previous graphic. Let's imagine we have a little network here on the left and a little network here on the right. Within this network here, because they are on the same local network, they would all be within the same broadcast domain. Meaning that if this device here happens to broadcast a message for everyone on its network, then this device and this device and this device and this device is all going to have to process that traffic. Now, if you imagine the internet was just one large network, and as opposed to just having maybe say 10 devices, you had billions of devices. If one device had to send a broadcast message, then pretty much every device in the world would have to process this. This is clearly not scalable, it would completely crash the internet. Ultimately, what I'm saying is that we need network segmentation. And this is why you have not just one large network, instead you have an interconnection of multiple networks. This is what the internet is ultimately all about. It's connecting lots and lots and lots and lots of small networks together. Now, when we actually break up our networks into smaller spaces, we become much more efficient. We do things like reduce broadcast domains and we reduce the impact on each device having to process particular traffic. And this is how we have the concept of a network address. Now, a network address will ultimately just identify a particular network, say this one on the left or this one here on the right. And within our network addresses, we have the concept of a host address. This identifies a unique host who happens to be within that particular network. And this is quite similar to what we're talking about when we talked about the postman analogy. That would mean that as opposed to having to look up a zip code or a postcode, we can look up a network address and it could take us to a very particular network that we're looking for. And if we want to find a very particular device on a particular network, that would be like the 12 Main Street. But we knew it wouldn't be 12 Main Street over here because the quote unquote postcode told us to look over here. Now in this case here, the postcode or the zip code is the network address and the actual house address with the number, this would be the host address. So here is the thing. Remember how I said we could have many different Main Streets across the world. Some may be in Birmingham, some may be in, I don't know, New York City. 
This is the same type of concept within networking. So what we might have here is we might have a network address on the left of 192.168.1.0. And I'll add in this slash 24 just now, but don't worry about that. We'll talk about that very shortly. Just focus on this part right here. And on this part right here, we might have a network address of 192.168.2.0. And again, slash 24, but just ignore that. So that would mean if we happen to have an IP address of 192.168.1.3, we would know by the first part here, 192.168.1, that we send it over to here. And then we decide which host within this network should actually get this traffic. Well, within this network, each of these hosts will have a host address. So in this case here, this device here might be 192. 168.1.1. This one here might be 192.168.1.2. And this one here might be 192.168.1.3. So that means that when we actually route this traffic to this IP address, we send it to 192.168.1, which goes to here instead of here. This part is excluded. And then once we get it in to this network, we can actually target the particular host, in this case, this one here, and we send it to this device. Now, there actually are some more details here, which I'm kind of abstracting away at the moment. For example, what I'm listing right here is something called private IP addresses, as opposed to public IP addresses, but we will definitely discuss this concept within this very skill. But generally speaking, as a high level overview, this is what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be sending traffic to particular networks, think of, the postcode or the zip code. And then when we want to get it to a particular host, we need a little bit more specific information within that wider network to target a particular computer or a particular printer or a particular server. That is where the actual host address comes into play. Now, there is a very particular format to the IP address and scheme we're using right here. Like I say, this is actually IPv4 addresses. So what I first want to do is to break down how these IPv4 addresses work and then we'll talk about different concepts such as private IP addresses and public IP addresses and what traffic can go onto the internet and what traffic cannot go onto the internet. But like I say, all of that is coming up very, very shortly. The next thing we're going to be talking about is the format of that IPv4 address. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hey guys, and welcome back. So in the previous nugget, we had talked about the high level concepts of IP addressing. We learned that we had such a thing as a network address, as well as a host address, which identifies the host within a particular network. Now, I did also briefly mention we had two different concepts. We had an IPv4 address and an IPv4. 6 address. IPv6 address is the newer format and there are way, 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 way more IPv6 addresses in the world than IPv4. Simply put, with IPv4, we're actually running out of addresses. We can't give each device an individual unique address and we have to work around this with some, well, inventive workarounds, let's just say. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But despite the fact that IPv4 is much more limited in address space, it's still the most popular form of IP addressing that you're going to see on the internet just now. And for that reason, this is the one which I want to focus on first. Now, the format of an IPv4 address is a very specific and particular format. What we're going to see here is we're going to see four blocks of numbers. We're going to see a number, then a dot, then a number, then a dot, then a number, then a dot, and then finally a number. We shall have one, two, three, four numbers. And now, each of these numbers can have a very particular range. The number in each of these what are called octets, this first octet, second octet, third octet, and fourth octet, the numbers can only range between zero to 255. So what I'm saying here is if someone showed you an IP address of 315, 143, 158, you knew straight away 
Now this is not a valid IP address because the first octet is actually out of the range of 0 to 255. This is not a valid IPv4 address. Whereas if I happen to say 143, 16, 8, 1, 3, 3, each of these octets is between 0 to 255. So this actually is a valid IPv4 format. But the question is, why do we actually have such a constraint? Why can't we actually go above 255? But ultimately, what we're doing here is that each octet is going to be a decimal representation of the underlying binary. Now, when it comes to IPv4 addresses, we actually have what are called 32 bits. Remember we talked about bits when we talked about the physical layer of the OSI model in the previous skill. Ultimately, within computing, everything breaks down to binary and the same type of thing is happening with our IP addresses. So take, for example, the IP address 192.168.1.1. What this is actually representing is this value right here, 11 and then six zeros, and then a dot, and then it's one zero one zero one zero zero, and then seven zeros and a one, and again seven zeros and a one. Now how was I able to translate that IP address into this binary here? But like I say, it's because of the binary system that we're actually using, and it's because of this binary system that we have a limit of 0 to 255 per each octet. Let me show you how it actually breaks down. Okay, so our IPv4 address has 32 bits. Now that is broken into four octets. That means that for each octet, we ultimately have eight bits. Four times eight gives us 32. So we have eight binary bits per octet. So let me just draw this in now. I'll say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, now each of these binary bits has a value, the ones on the left having more values than the ones on the right. So the one on the right here that has a value of 1, this one has a value of 2, this one has a value of 4, this is a value of 8, and then we get 16, 32, 64, and the last one has a value of 1 to 8. So think about this then. If I wanted to represent an octet with the value 1, how would I actually represent this? Well, for the first bit right here, in fact, let me just put my blackboard up. If we're trying to represent the value 1, should we use the value 128? Obviously not, because 128 is way higher than 1. What about 64? No, we don't want to use that. What about 33? Nope, still too big. 16, still too big. 8, 4, 2, all too big. But number 1, we do want to use that value. So we just use the value 1. Now within this here, we have ultimately created an octet with a value 1. So this would actually give, in an IP address form, the value 1. So think about this. If I had an IP address of 1.1.1.1, ultimately in binary, that would be what we just saw there. Seven zeros and a 1. And then again, for the next octet, seven zeros and a 1. And then the next octet, seven zeros and a 1. And I'm actually running out of space here, but continue on. That would be the binary value of this IP address here. This IP address here is just the decimal representation of this binary. So think about it. What if I wanted to represent the IP address value of the decimal value 15? Let's just say one of the octets had the value 15 here. Let's just focus on this octet right here. How would we represent that in binary? Well, again, we have our 8 bits, the first bit is 128, the second 64, the next 32, then we get to 16, then 8, then 4, 2, and the 8th one is 1. So how would we represent 15 then? Well again, do we want to turn on the leftmost bit? Well no, that would be far too high. Same again with 64, same again with 32, even 16, slightly too high. What about 8? Well, 8 we could use. So now we have a value of 15 minus the 8 we've just used. That is going to leave us a value of 7. So how do we represent 7? Well, we could use a 4 to represent the 7. So now we're going to say 7 minus 4 gives us 3. We're now trying to represent 3. Can we use a 2? Yes, we can. So now we're going to say 3 minus 2 leaves us 1. 
How would we represent that? Well, we could use the one. So think about it. What we've done here is if we add up these values, one, add two, add four and eight, that actually totals 15. So this binary representation is how we would represent the value 15 within our IP address space. So now if you had an IP address of something like say 192.168.1.1, like I say, all this is doing is telling us the binary value in a more readable form. In its binary value, what this would actually look like would be 1, 1, and then 6 zeros, and then 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, and then 7 zeros, and a 1, and again, 7 zeros, and a 1. Because think about it, the first one here we have 128 add 64. If you add that up, it actually totals 192. The next part here, we actually have 128, add 32, add 8, so 128, add 32, add 8, actually gives us 168, so this represents 168, and then we have only the value 1 here, which represents 1, and again here, only the value 1 here, which represents 1, so now we have our dotted decimal IPv4 address, which is representing this underlying binary, now think about it, what we have just done here, if we actually imagine what could possibly be the highest number we could give an octet, well we could do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, we could turn on all the bits for a particular octet. Now what would that actually mean? That would mean we could add on 128, add 64, add 32, add 16, add 8, add 4, add 2, add 1. If you actually add up those values, what it actually amounts to is 255. So this is why the range can only be as high as 255 because we only have 8 bits to work per each octet. And it's also why the lowest value can only ever be 0 because the lowest thing we could do would be putting in 8 zeros, which is going to be, of course, equal to the value 0. So we can go as low as 0 and as high as 255 for every single octet and we have four octets to represent our 32-bit address. And that is ultimately what we're doing when we give our network a particular network address. We represent it maybe as 192.168.10.0. It's a dotted decimal IPv4 address representing the underlying 32-bit binary. And within that address, we can give each host a host address, which will be a value within that network. Now the way we can determine if an IP address is a host address or a network address is by using something called a subnet mask. Now this is something we will be talking about very very shortly but it absolutely relates to what we just saw before with our dotted decimals using our 32 bits available. But just before we actually talk about this I briefly want to discuss the concept we have of private addresses and public addresses as well as the particular class A, B and C ranges which we can use for our networks. So what exactly is that all about? Well the good news is we'll be talking about that next so I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hey guys and welcome back. So in the previous few nuggets we had introduced the concepts around basic networking and IP addressing. Now what I want to discuss with you is the concepts that I briefly mentioned or hinted at and that was that we could have private IP addresses as well as public IP addresses. Now this ultimately comes down to the fact that we have well a very limited amount of IPv4 addresses. Now we actually do have around 4 billion roughly. Now back in the day that seemed like way more than enough, more than we would ever need. But the internet happened, the internet exploded and the reality is this is nowhere near enough going to see us into the future. So here is what happened. We devised a way whereby we could reuse the same IPv4 address over and over and over again. Now that might sound strange given the fact that when I in the previous nugget discussed IP addresses I basically said how we could use these IP addresses to locate a unique device even when you're communicating over a massive network such as the internet. 
Now just before we actually tackle this problem, the first thing I just want to address is the fact that we have different classes of IP address. And once we understand that, we'll talk about what are the private ranges within those classes and why they exist. So check this out, think about it. We have a limited amount of IP addresses available and these IP addresses can be used to denote networks, i.e. we can have network addresses and we also need to have lots of host addresses for individual hosts within a network. So what we actually want to be able to do is to define how many hosts can be within a network because if you have a massive network such as maybe like an ISP, maybe you need to have lots and lots and lots of address space. Whereas if you have a smaller network, maybe you don't need quite as many IP addresses. Now, because unsurprisingly, when something is limited, it becomes more scarce. And then when it's more scarce, it becomes more valuable. So here's the thing. If we have a limited amount of IP addresses and you need a very large chunk of those addresses, well, that is going to cost you quite a bit of money because like I say, as they are scarce, if you want to buy a lot of something which is pretty rare or something that is running out, it costs you money. So we wouldn't want to have to spend all this money on a massive address space if we only need to have, say for example, 100 devices with a unique IP address. So this is where the idea of classes came in. So now we come to the idea of classes. So there is such a thing as a class a address as well as a class B address and a class C. Now a class A, this is the biggest address space, whereas a class B, this is still quite big, but a little bit smaller and a class C smaller yet again. So let me just show you the actual address range for a class A. If we have an IP address from 1.0.0.0 all the way up to 1.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.
zero, zero, all the way up to 10, 255, 255, 255. If you happen to use an IP address within this range, say for example, 10, 10, 10, 1 for example, this would actually be within the class A range, but it would actually be a private IP address. Similarly, if we look at the class B range, which was 128.000 all the way up to 191.255.255.255, within that range, if we happen to use an IP address within 172.16.0.0 all the way up to 172.31.255.255, if we use an IP address within this range, say for example 172.18.1.1, 18 is within 16 and 31 after all, then we would be using a private address within the class B range. And then lastly, we have the class C range, which is 192.0.0.0 all the way up to 223.255.255.255. Within that range, we have a private range, and you probably will recognize this one, I do believe, 192.168.0.0 all the way up to 192.168.255.255. So if you happen to have an IP address of 192.168.1.1, this would be a private IP address. So now that we actually know the ranges, let's talk about what it actually means to have a private IP address. So like I say, we do have these very, very large address spaces, but they are nowhere near enough to cover all the devices. We want reusability. Now the way we can reuse these IP addresses is that we can actually reuse the private IP addresses. But here is the deal, we have to use them privately, i.e. we actually can't advertise these networks over the internet. They're not reachable over the internet, they're only reachable within your local network. So what this actually means is that this network here, we actually could give it the network address of 192.168.1.0 and this network here, we could actually give it the same private IP address, 192.168.1.0. Now this might be confusing because you might think, how are we going to be able to route traffic and differentiate between this IP address over here versus this one over here? Now the internet actually does a little trick and we don't have to worry about the details too much, but it's something called network address translation. What it ultimately means is that all you do is, is on the outside of your router, you will give that a public IP address. Say for example, 8.8.8.8. .8 and on the inside of your network, you can just use private IP addressing. So if anyone wants to reach you, they would actually send the message to 8.8.8.8. .8 and this would actually have to be globally unique. This cannot be duplicated, it can only exist in one place on the internet because it's a public address, not a private one. Cannot be repeated. But here's the thing, once it goes to this address, your router can do some fancy tricks and it can actually map the public address, say for example, 8.8.8.8, .8 to a private one such as 192.168.1.1. That means that within your network, you can actually have thousands and thousands and thousands of devices using private IP addresses, but they're all sharing the same public one. So this allows us to reuse IP addresses and really conserve address space because what it means is that as opposed to having to give every device a unique IP address, all we really need to do is to give, say for example, one interface on a company's router, say for example, a massive enterprise, that could have just one global IP address and we have billions to choose from. Whereas on the inside of that network, that could actually be a network of 60,000 devices and they could all be using these private IP addresses. And in fact, so if I happen to just go to my Windows machine here, open up a command prompt and I type in ipconfig, which is the Windows command, you can actually see the adapter for my VMware, which is where I hold my virtual machines, actually has an IP address of 192.168.31.1. Whereas my wireless address for my actual home computer has one of 192.168.0.39. Now it's very, very possible, in fact probable, that someone watching this nugget is going to have this exact same IP address somewhere in their network used. The reality is, 
is that you and I can both use the same IP address because it's been used privately within our own internal network. When we are actually communicating with the internet, we actually have a different public facing IP address that is not this IP address. So this gives us great reusability. So what we want to understand here is that we have different classes of IP address ranges, class A, B and C. The class A range gives us the most amount of hosts, the class B gives us a significant amount, just over 65,000, but nowhere near as much as a class A. And a class C gives us an even smaller amount yet again. Despite this though, within each one of these ranges, we actually have the ability for private IP addressing and they can actually be used and reused all over the world within local private networks. And these IP addresses cannot be accessed directly over the public internet. Now we have talked about the idea of having more hosts and less hosts per a network address, but we haven't really understood exactly how this is working and I did hint that this was related to what is called a subnet mask. Now the subnet mask is a very important concept and this is what is going to allow us to unlock the information which tells us what a host address is and what a network address is, as well as how many hosts are available within a given network range. And the good news is, is that that's what we're going to be talking about in the very next nugget. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hey guys and welcome back. So previously we had been discussing the different types of classes that we could have within our IP addresses. Now this ultimately allowed us different address spaces, i.e. different sizes of networks. But what I hinted at was that the size of a network is actually determined by what is called a sub net mask. So let's actually dive in and find out what a sub net mask is and how it actually works and makes sense. So let me just give you an example of a network with a subnet mask. Now, suppose I had a network address of 192.168.1.1 and this is a slash 24. Now this actual way this has been described using a slash value such as slash 16 or slash 8 or slash 24, when we use this slash value, this is referred to as CIDR notation, classless interdomain routing. And all it is, it's representing the subnet mask in this slash forum. Now really, what this subnet mask would look like if I did this, 1.1, the actual subnet mask of a slash 24 would actually be 255.255.255.255. Okay, so, so far, this is still not making any sense. Where is the correlation here? How does this help us? And how does this determine the size of a particular network? Well, let me show you how this actually works then. So remember, we can ultimately translate our dotted decimal IPv4 addresses into binary. So 192.168.1.1 would actually be represented in binary as 1.1 and then six zeros and then a dot and then one zero one zero one and then another dot and then seven zeros and a one and then again seven zeros and a one. Now the subnet mask, like I said, was going to be 255.255.255.0. So that would mean that the first octet would have all the bits turned on to get to 255. So that would be eight ones. That would be the first octet. The second octet would also have eight ones. The third octet, again, would have eight ones. And the last one would have no ones. Again, if you add up all the green ones here, it would total 255.255.255.255. Now the important thing is, is that when the ones stop in the subnet mask, that tells us the actual network address. So we can actually see here, if I just delete this part, that if we look where the ones stop, they go all the way right up to this point here. That's where the ones in the subnet mask stop. And this part here 
actually tells us which part of the address is the network address and which part is left for host. Now to actually work out the network address, what we can do is, is do a logical AND between the subnet mask and the host. So let's try this. So if we want to do this logical AND to get this network address, we would do one AND one. Well, one and one are both on. So that would make a positive one. The next one is one and one. That is also true. So we'll make that a one two. Now it's one and a zero. So because we are doing a logical and, we need both of the values to be one. Otherwise, we're going to give it a value of zero, which is what we got here. Same again here, one and a zero. That means it's going to be a zero. Same again, one zero. And we just continue this on. So that's what we get for our first octet. Next one, we do one and a one. That gives us a one. The next one, one and a zero, gives us a zero. One and a one gives us a one. And we just follow this pattern again. Then we come to the third octet, one and a zero, that gives us zero, one and a zero, gives us zero, all the way up to the last one, which actually is one and one, so that gives us a one, and now we can do the final part here, zero and zero is zero, and we just complete this. Now we get to the final one, which is a zero and a one, that is still going to be a zero because we need both of them to be a one. So now, this is actually the network address. So if we actually do the addition here, we do 128 add 64, that's going to be 192, then we have a dot. Then we're going to have 128 add 32 add 8, so that will be 168. And this part here, we're just going to have the 1 on, so that is 1. And then for this part here, the value is going to be 0, so that means the network address here is actually going to be 192.168.1.0 even though the host itself is 192.168.1.1 so that means this host is 192.168.1.1 but it belongs to the 192.168.1.0 network now the way we actually got the slash notation is if you just happen to count the number of consecutive ones in the subnet mask that will give you that CIDR notation so we have up here eight ones, 16 ones, and then 24 ones before they stop. And that really is what we're getting. We have 24 ones in our subnet mask, so we just call that a slash 24. So if we get an IP address and we say 172.16.15.1, and we give it a slash 16 mask. So in binary, we could give that a value of 10101100, 1, 0, 0, which translates to 172. And then we do zero, 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 one, zero, 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 which gives us 16. Then we have zero, 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 one, 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 which represents 15 if you add it up. And then the last octet, we just have a one. Now, if we're going to have a slash 16 mask, what we will do is, is put 16 consecutive ones. So we'll do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's the first octet. Then nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and now we just do all zeros. So now we just do our logical AND. We do one and one, that's equal to one. One and zero is zero. One and one is one, and we just continue this pattern on. So that's the first octet, here is the second one. And the third is going to be zero, 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 zero. And then we have zero and one, which is still a zero. So all zeros, and then again, still all zeros when we do our logical AND for the fourth octet. So if we actually transfer this into our decimal notation, this will give us the network, which if we add it up, 128, add 32, add 8, add 4, is going to be 172. Then we're going to have just 16 in this one, and then 0 and 0, and we know the mask is slash 16. So the network is 172.16.0.0 slash 16, even though we have a host address of 172.16.15.1. So what this means is that this host lives within this network. Now here is the thing, if you happen to do the same calculation for 172.16.19.2.0, Three, three slash 16, you would find that this would actually also, when we do the logical AND, 
give this exact same value, 172.16.00 slash 16, which means that this host address and this host address are both on the same local network. Whereas if you happen to do the same thing for 172.18.233.1 slash 16, for example, you will find out that this actually gives a different value than this network address, meaning that this device here is on a different network than this one right here. Now this only tells us part of the story. Let me show you how this actually relates to the size of a network. So if you have a network address of 192.168.1.0/24, it means the first 24 bits, i.e. all the way up to this octet, is part of the network, i.e. Everything within the same network will all have these first three octets the same. And it's this octet that can actually be used for host addresses. So we know we only have one octet to address our host. So that means we have eight bits to play with. And we know our values 128, 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, and 1. So that means theoretically, the only values you could give this last octet range from 0 to 255. So if you actually count this up, this means that there are actually 256 addresses here, including the 0 and including the 255. But here is the thing, we actually don't have all of the 256 addresses. We actually need to minus 2 from them because the 0 address itself is what is called the network address and that can't be used by a host that actually has to have its own address and the last address within the range the 255 this is known as the broadcast address this is the address we use when we want to talk to every single device on our same network so really the acceptable range we can give an address here is dot one all the way to dot 254 so really we only have 250 host addresses. So ultimately what I'm seeing here is if we have a network address of 192.168.1.0 slash 24, we could have a host on that network of say for example 192.168.1.1. We could have another one have a host address of 1.2 and another one of 1.3 all the way up to 192.168.1.254. And that would be the host addresses exhausted. We would have no more space to do such a thing. Whereas, if you actually think about it, if we do 172.16.0.0 slash 16, that just means that this part here, the first 16 bits, stay the same for the network. And we now actually have two octets, i.e. 16 bits free, to address our host. So as opposed to having 254 available host spaces on a slash 24, when we have a slash 16 network, we actually have about 16,000 addresses left for the host. Say for example, 172.16.13.11 slash 16, that would be on the same network as 172.200.5. These two would be on the exact same network we would have way more flexibility to address these hosts. And this is what I was talking about with the class A, the class B, and the class C network. Say, for example, a class A network would actually have, by default, a slash 8 mask. So only the 10 would have to stay the same. All of these other three octets would be freed up for host addresses. This is why you can have so many more hosts free on this range. Whereas, in our class B range, we would have a slash 16 mask, meaning these two octets would have to stay the same for everyone on the same network, leaving us only two free octets for our hosts. And when we come to the class C, which gets even smaller, something like this with a slash 24, it means that the first three octets have to stay the same for the network. And we only have one free octet for the rest of the hosts on the network, which is going to be substantially smaller space. So really, the subnet mask here, which we're seeing inside the notation, this really tells us what the network address is for a particular network, and it also tells us how much space we have left within this range to free up and give to individual hosts. So now when you happen to look at your IP addressing, you can check what type of subnet mask you have, and you can actually conceive 
how many additional hosts that you could fit on your local network. Now I will say that to understand subnetting, it's just one of these things that absolutely has to be practiced over and over and over again and then absolutely it will click. So I definitely would encourage you to re-watch this nugget a few times just to get everything clear in your head. But it's the same for everyone with practice, it will make sense. So that is us for subnet masks. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hey guys and welcome back. So now what I want to do to close off is just to have a brief word on IPv6 addresses. Now the thing to really note about IPv6 addresses is that they are way, 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 way bigger than IPv4 addresses. Quite honestly, there is enough address space within IPv6 to give each human alive trillions of addresses each. There is honestly no way we're going to be running out of IPv6 addresses. There's just way too many. Now, the reason why IPv6 hasn't quite taken off is, like I say, because we do have some workarounds in IPv4, such as private addressing, and we can translate all those private addresses using network address translation to a single public IPv4 address. So this is allowing us to hang on with white knuckles to IPv4 and people are wanting to do this because IPv4 is a little bit easier to navigate and it's just more familiar, people are more comfortable with it. Now, one thing we want to note really is there are some major differences with respect to the formatting of an IPv6 address versus IPv4. Now an IPv4 address as we saw would look something like this, we would have four octets that ultimately translate to 32 bits. Now in the case of IPv6, we're not working with 32 bits, we actually have 128 bits. And the way this is represented is not in dotted decimal notation, instead we actually use a hexadecimal format. So let me show you how an IPv6 address may actually look. So each block is not called an octet, it's called a hextet. And it's going to be made up of four numbers separated, not with a dot, but by a colon. And as opposed to having four octets, instead with IPv6, we're going to have eight hextets. So an address might look something like this. And this part might surprise you. Yep, we're actually using letters as well. So this is what an IPv6 address might look like. Like I say, they're actually broken up into hextets, which are these things here. And we're going to have eight of them each one separated by a colon here, see this, colon, colon, and the values of each hextet is going to be hexadecimal. That means each value, such as this, 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 and this, can range from zero to nine, or from the letters A to F. Now what the letter A actually represents is the number 10, and B represents the number 11, and C 12, D 13, E 14, and F is 15. So really we can represent a value from zero all the way to 15 with each individual value here. Now, once again, this is actually just a representation of binary. So let me just take, say for example, this first hextet. Let's try to convert this into its binary form. So we have the value 2001. Now each value here, represents four bits, four bits, four bits, and four bits, which means that each hextet ultimately represents 16 bits, four, eight, 12, 16. So we have 16 bits for each hextet, we have eight hextets, that means we have 128 bits. But let me show you how we represent each value right here. So again, 2001, let's see how we represent two and the binary here. Now each one represents four bits, so we're going to have one, two, three, four, and the values in this case is going to be eight, four, two, one. Now how in binary do we represent two using these values? We will say zero for the eight value, zero for the four value, but we'll actually have a one for the two value, that's going to give us two, and then we'll have zero. So you see that? This actually represents two, whereas the zero here, We'll have our eight, four, two, and one. Do we want to use the eight value? No. Do we want to use the four? No. Either the two or the one. Same again for this one here. 
we'll just say 0, 0, 0, 0. That gives us 0. And to make the 1 here, using the 8, 4, 2, 1, we'll have nothing for the 8 value, nothing for the 4 value, nothing for the 2, but we will switch the 1 on. So ultimately, 2001 represents these 16 bits in binary. See that? 2001 ultimately represents all of this binary. And that is just one hextet. We have seven more hextets, which ultimately gives us 128 bits of binary. And we can play with these bits to make up our addresses. Let me just take one other one for you. Let me take another hextet. Let's say another hextet was 1C5B. Okay, so we have our 8, 4, 2, and 1 values. How do we make 1? We don't want to use the 8, we don't want to use the 4, we don't want to use the 2, but we do want to use the 1. Now C, A is 10, B is 11, C is 12, which is what we want, D is 13, E is 14, and F is 15. So if we want to make 12, how do we make 12 using these digits? Well, we want to use the 8 value, that gives us 8. We also want to use the 4 value. 8 and 4 actually gives us 12. We don't need any more. So we don't want to use the 2 and we don't want to use the 1. This represents C in binary. And for the 5, we don't want to use the 8. We do want to use the 4. We don't want to use the 2. We do want to use the 1. 4 and 1 equals 5. And then the B, the B is 11. How do we get to 11? We want to use the 8 value. We don't want to use the 4 because that would be too much. So we'll say no 4. Do we want to use the 2? Yes, that will give us 8 and 2, which is 10. We need one more. That means we want to use the 1 at the end. That will give us 8 and 2 and 1, which equals 11. And now, here we have our 16 binary bits represented in hexadecimal within this hextet. Now, just like with IPv4, we also have the concept of our mask value, which tells us which part of the address is the network and which part is reserved for the host address. Now, typically, you're almost always going to see IPv6 addresses with a slash 64 mask. The reason why is that we can be quite liberal giving away such massive address space away because we have so much addresses to use. This gives someone a huge amount of addresses to use, and that is just for a single network. Now this slash 64 gives two to the power of 64 host addresses. So to get a size of the scale of what we're talking about, what that actually equates to is this number right here. I'm not even sure I could say it. <laughs> That is how many free addresses we would have for hosts on just one single slash 64 network using IPv6. So this part alone here would be what? 744 trillion, 73 billion, 709 million, 551,616. And like I say, it just gets even crazier. So really what I'm saying is that we don't have to worry so much about having to carve up these networks in quite the same way because we have so many addresses, it's actually just easier to give everyone a slash 64 mask. We're never going to run out of these addresses. So a typical IPv6 address would look something like this. We have eight hextets, which ultimately represent 128 binary bits. And very typically you're going to see just a slash 64 mask, which means that the first 64 bits, i.e. this portion right here, would be the network address and everything here would all be free to be allocated to our host addresses, which as we saw is an absolutely massive amount. Now, to be honest, there is in fact much, much more about IPv6 that we could be covering. We have things such as global addresses and link local addresses. We can do things such as zero compression. But honestly, that is outside the scope of the examination. Really, just understand for IPv6, the address space is way, way larger. We're going to be using hexadecimal, we understand that the addresses are 128 bits long, and we understand that the valid values we can use for each value is zero to nine, or the letters A through F. And those really are the main concepts that we want to be focusing on when it comes to IPv6. Okay, doc, so I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.
Hey everyone and welcome back. So in the previous skill we introduced the concept of networking. Now we learned that networking is a crucial component to systems administration. This is ultimately how our devices can talk to one another and allow for the connectivity that we need within our systems. Now what we're going to be doing in this skill is again focusing on networking but we're going to look at some of the persistent networking configurations. So that really is the plan for this skill. This is an objective within the LPIC-1 examination. We have to cover this. But before we dive into looking at some type of configuration files with respect to persistent configuration, what I want to do is to help you understand some of the networking concepts that we are going to be talking about within these configuration files. So we want to be able to understand basic routing concepts. And again, not too in depth. We don't have to be looking at this from the point of view of a Cisco certified network engineer, but we do want to have a grasp of basic routing, such as things like default routes and understanding what exactly is a gateway. And we will also address some other concepts such as DHCP. Again, not going to spend too much time on these concepts. I just want to highlight what is going on so that when we actually talk about the configuration of these features or the persistent configuration of these features, it's not just a black box and that you really understand what it is we are trying to do when we are manipulating these configuration files. Now, after we actually cover these basic concepts, we will be looking at things such as the network manager. This is going to come in the form of a command line utility that we can use to ultimately help us manage our network configurations. We're also going to be looking at particular commands such as the IP adder command, which is very useful for configuring networking information, as well as looking at other tools to configure host name information. And we will also spend some time looking at some of the legacy tools that we could use to configure our networking configs. The reason being, of course, whenever we are using these legacy tools, even though it might feel a little bit outdated, is that you can expect the possibility of these questions relating to these legacy configuration tools on the actual exam itself. So I would be remiss to not at least cover them a little bit. So that really is what we have lined up within this skill. We've got a lot of useful information to get to, but like I say, the very, very first thing that I want to talk to you about are those networking fundamentals so that we can have them under our belt, clearly understood, and then we can then proceed into using our configuration tools to manipulate these features. Okay, doc, so that is the plan for this skill. The very first thing that we're going to be looking at are those networking fundamentals that I want to talk about first, and that is what we're going to be doing in the very next nugget. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hey guys, and welcome back. So in the previous nugget, we had talked about what we have planned for this skill. Now, the very first thing that I want to talk about are some of these networking concepts, just to kind of clarify what it is that we aim to actually configure. So check this out. Let me first begin with something called DHCP. What this actually stands for is the Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. Now, what this actually does is honestly super, super useful. So think about this. Let's say you are on a little network here and we'll say the network is 192.168.1.0 slash 24. Now we actually talked about networks and subnets in a previous skill, so this should not be too unfamiliar to you. Basically what this means is that we would have 254 available host within this network. That would mean that a host could have an IP address of 192.168.1.1 or 1.2 or 1.3 all the way up to 1.254. So think about this then. Imagine we had, let's say, around about 250 devices. We would have enough IP addresses for all of these hosts, but it would actually be a little bit cumbersome to have to log in 
to each device 250 separate times and then manually give each one an IP address. Say for example, the first device you log into, you give it 1.1. Then you log out, go to the second device, run through the configurations, give it 192, 168, 1.2, so on, so forth. Now again, this would be possible, although not optimal, but imagine once again that the network was even bigger yet again. Let's say we had a network of 10, 0, 0, 0, slash 8. So now we're dealing with millions of hosts potentially. Clearly, we do not want to be logging into each device millions of times, giving each one a manual IP address within a specified range, and then hoping that we don't have any type of conflict. Simply put, the method I'm describing right now is manual configuration, whereas with DHCP, we can have this allocation of IP addressing be automatic or rather dynamic, hence the name. Now, like I say, this doesn't just make it easier by avoiding us having to physically type in the IP address for every single host. This will allow us to avoid particular conflicts because you wouldn't want to log in, say, for example, to this device, give it the IP address 192.168.1.249 and then accidentally go into this device and give it the exact same IP address. This is just going to cause networking issues. We would have a duplication of the same IP address within the same network. Wouldn't it be much easier if all the devices in your network could just talk to a single device and say, hey, give me an IP address within the correct network. And that device would ultimately serve a particular IP address to one host. And because of this, it would not serve that same IP address to another host instead it would give the next host a completely different IP address still within this particular range. And again, we could give this host an IP address once again. This is exactly what we're talking about with DHCP. So ultimately, when this process happens, we would actually have some type of DHCP server. Now this can be in the form of a server itself, which is dedicated to doing such a task. But very often it may just be a little router on the edge of the network also acting as the DHCP server. This will also be quite common, like I say. Now, let's just imagine that was the setup for the purposes of this little diagram. So this one here is going to act not just as the router out of the network, but also as the DHCP server, giving all the devices within the network an IP address. Now, here is the thing. When we happen to create what is called a DHCP pool. So when we are actually creating these DHCP pools, the devices which are ultimately getting these IP addresses from a particular network range are not just getting an IP address only. They will get an IP address and they will automatically be assigned the correct subnet mask, which we know is crucial for distinguishing between a network address and a host address. And again, not just this, very often we're going to actually give out DNS information, i.e. say for example, this device here sends out a DHCP request. The DHCP server in this case will not just give it an IP address with a subnet mask, it will also tell this device a particular DNS server, say for example 8.8.8.8, where it can send its DNS request so that if it happens to go to the address google.com, the actual host here doesn't actually have to type in the IP address. The host will have a DNS server to resolve this name to the actual IP address. And here is the thing, not only this, the actual server will also give this client what is called a default gateway. Now we'll talk about default gateways in a little minute. So really understand that when we're talking about DHCP, we're talking about a technology which is super, super common within all of IT. And it's a technology that allows us to automatically manage the assignment of IP addressing within our networks, which is going to avoid conflict. But it's also going to give the devices, i.e. the clients requesting a particular IP address, additional information such as a DNS server as well as this thing called the default gateway. So let's now talk about this concept of the default gateway then, shall we? So think about this. Let us imagine here that we have this little network, okay? And we can say this network has the network address of 192.168.1.2. 
168.1.0 slash 24, okay? So everyone in here, that is the network address. So this device here, let's maybe say this was 1.2, this was 1.3, this was 1.4. Now, all of these devices could freely talk to one another, no problem at all, because they are within the same network. But if one of these devices, say for example, this one here, like I said, happened to try to access google.com and the DNS resolver said, hey, this is actually 8.8.8.8. Well, 8.8.8.8 is not within the network 192.168.1.0. So this device here can talk to the devices within this network, but how on earth is this device here going to talk to a device outside of its network, such as, like I say, 8.8.8.8. Well, ultimately, what has to happen is that the traffic has to be routed. Now, I'm sure you are familiar that in your house, you have the concept of something called a router. This allows you to get your internet access, or if you happen to be American, you may pronounce it a router. Now, this is exactly the tool that we need. What this allows us to do is to access different networks. This is what routing or routing, if you prefer, is all about. So think about this. So this device here can talk to this device here and this device here because it is within the same network. If it wants to talk to an external network, say for example, the network over here, which maybe be 172.16.0.0 slash 16, it's actually got to talk to a router first because this router can route the traffic to a different network entirely. And this is ultimately what we are talking about when we're talking about a default gateway. What we want to do is to give every device within our network a way out of our network, a gateway to other networks, so to speak. And the way we do this is providing the devices within our network a path to a router which can actually take the traffic to another network. So when we actually configure this default gateway, in this case, that would be this device here, we want to basically tell this device here, hey, if you have traffic for an external network, i.e. traffic that is not within your range of 192.168.24, what you should do is send that traffic to this guy right here. That will be your default gateway out to the other networks in the world. So this is ultimately how this works because this interface here on the inside, this would be configured to be within that network range of 192.168.1.0/24, meaning that all the devices here who are within that network range, they will be able to talk to this inside interface of the router, and then the router can do some calculations and route that traffic to an entirely different network. Now, a common strategy, although it is not mandatory, but you will often see this when it comes to looking at configurations, is that it's very common to give the default gateway the first available IP address within the network. So say, for example, to use our network example, 192.168.1.0 slash 24, what is the first available host address? Well, it's going to be 192.168.1.1. And what you would do is you would give this inside interface here of the router that particular address. So that would be 192.168.1.1 right here. And in effect, when this device here, who doesn't yet have an IP address, sends out what is called a broadcast message, trying to find a DHCP server, this device here could tell this device, hey, you can have an IP address of 192.168.1.2. You will have a subnet mask of 255. Dot two five five dot two five five dot zero, which is a slash twenty four mask used inside the notation, as we have learned. And if you want to actually leave your own local network, send the traffic to one nine two one six eight one dot one. That will be your default gateway out of the network. And if you want to be able to resolve your DNS queries, you can send that request to 8.8.8.8. Now, the reason why I'm using 8.8.8.8, there is nothing particularly special. This happens to be Google's public DNS server, but you could also configure DHCP services on this device right here if you so choose. So really, if this device here tried to look up cbtnuggets.com, 
it would have to send that request to 8.8.8.8, but that is not within its network range, its local network that is. So where would this device send this to? It would actually send it to 192.168.1.1, the default gateway, and tell the default gateway, hey, send this request to this external network. And then this device could route that request to the DNS server, return the answer back to this device, giving it the actual external IP address for cbtnuggets.com, which again would be another external address. And then this device could actually make that request to an external network, i.e. to the CBT Nuggets website. And how would it get there? Again, it would send that request to the default gateway and that would actually route the traffic to cbtnuggets.com. So this is ultimately what we're talking about when we're talking about default gateways. So when we happen to be looking at these particular values within these configuration files, you'll know that your default gateway has to be on the same network as you because you have to be able to reach it locally so that it can take that local traffic and route it to remote networks if necessary. Now, another quick concept I want to just briefly talk about is the concept of a default route. Now, this is a very common thing. Let me just show you what it actually is. Let's imagine that this is your home network right here. So this would be your little router, and let's imagine this is just your PC or your laptop. So let's imagine that your PC had the address 192.168.1.2. Your default gateway was 192.168.1.1. And if you happen to send a request to some random website, let's just say youtube.com, it's very likely in your home environment that you haven't actually configured any detailed routing information on your router. We briefly mentioned how we can have things such as routing protocols to learn particular routes, but realistically, what your little home router is going to do, it's just going to have a default route because your home router is going to be connected to your ISP's router. And realistically, what this default route is going to say is, is that when your home device sends a request to your default gateway, your home router, and your router doesn't actually have a path how to get to this remote network. All it's going to do, it's just going to, by default, send whatever traffic to the ISP, and the ISP is actually going to have all of the routing information for all of the different locations across the world because the actual ISP router itself is going to have way more detailed and complex configurations on their devices, and they can actually find these devices. So your default route ultimately is saying, hey, I don't care if I get a request for 8.8.8.8, .8 I'm just going to send it to this router here, and it'll work it out. Similarly, if I get a request for 21.83.55.1, Again, another random IP address. I don't know what to do with it, but all I'm going to do is I'm going to route it to my ISP by default and the ISP can figure it out and send me the traffic back. This is what we're talking about when we're talking about a default route. And these are very, very, very common configurations to actually see. Like I say, DHCP information to give the clients within the network their IP addressing, as well as information about what their default gateway should be so that they can leave the local network and the device right here at the edge that is going to act as the default gateway very often is going to have very simple routing and that routing is probably just going to be a simple default route which points to the ISP as its next hop. So I just really want you to solidify these concepts in your mind because like I say these are some of the values that we're going to be looking at when we look at our network configuration files. And I really do think it makes sense for you to really visually understand what it is we're talking about. So it's not all just mumbo jumbo and random numerical values. You should be able to piece together in your mind what we're trying to do and what is the outcome of our particular configurations. Okie doke, so I really just wanted to give a brief introduction to the underlying protocols and technologies at play here. Now that we have this under our belt, let's now dig in into making these networking changes. The very first tool which I want to talk to you about is the Network Manager. And that is what we're going to be talking about in the very next nugget. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.
Hey guys, and welcome back. So in the previous nugget, we had discussed some of the core networking fundamentals that we really should be aware about. Now what I want to talk to you about is actually using a tool such as Network Manager to be able to alter our networking configurations. Now as it transpires, what Network Manager actually is, it's basically just a network service. And all this service does, as you can probably assume by the name, is this service allows you to manage your networking devices and connections. So what we can actually do therefore with Network Manager, we can manage Ethernet connectivity. We could also manage our Wi-Fi connectivity. In fact, we could actually create our own Wi-Fi access points if we so choose. Similarly, we can actually manage mobile broadband connections. So a lot of power here with the network manager. But what I actually want to talk to you about is a command line tool that we can use to actually interact with network manager. Now the name of the command line utility that we're going to be exploring is something called NMCLI. This is a network manager command line interface. So what we can do is we can make sure that it is first installed if it isn't installed by default on your system. So what I would suggest you do is do a sudo apt update, type in your password, and then we can say sudo apt install network hyphen manager, hit enter. I will now say why. Now we can start the network manager using systemd by saying sudo systemctl or systemcontrol if you prefer. And then start network hyphen manager if we hit enter. And I now do sudo systemctl status of the network manager and hit enter. We can now see that this is indeed now active. Perfect. So I can press Q. And now let's actually explore what NMCLI actually is. Because here is the reality, when you typically manage your network settings very often on your desktop, you'll be using the graphical user interface. Now sometimes you maybe have issues with your graphical user interface and it crashes and you want to be able to achieve the same type of thing or the same type of results, should I say, using the command line. This is what NMCLI is going to actually do. So the first thing I'm going to do here is clear my screen. I will now say man NMCLI. And if I hit enter, this is going to take me to the man page. Now it says here, this is the command line tool for controlling network manager. Now we can see here with NMCLI, we can do quite a lot of powerful things. We can create, display, edit, delete, activate, as well as deactivate our network connections. Not only this, we're also going to be able to see the status of our networking devices. Now it tells us some of the use cases here, as we can see, are scripting, so automating your configurations. So it makes sense that we would use a command line utility as opposed to a graphical user interface and a mouse, of course. But as we see here, many machines are headless and only have a command line utility. Therefore, we want to know how to manage your networking using this tool. So let's scroll on down, we'll push the space bar. If you keep pressing space bar, you will come to the general commands. This is the main part which I want to kind of focus on just now. These are the commands we want to check out. So say for example, we can use the status command and this will show us the overall status of network manager. Similarly, we can actually get as well as change the system host name using NMCLI. And if you just keep scrolling on down, you're going to see more and more options available to you. Plenty of them right here. So as always, I always encourage read the man page to get more information. But, but for now, let's just dive right in. So let's press Q to quit the man page. Let me just clear my screen. So if I just type the command NMCLI itself, what we can see here are my connections. Now I'm not going to go through all the format of what this is. This ultimately just describes my interface. The fact that it says EN tells me that this is an ethernet connection. Now the reality is this is actually a virtual machine so the connection is not exactly accurate. I'm actually using Wi-Fi but the virtual machine is ultimately emulating some type of ethernet connection that's why it's saying this but if you happen to you run this command on a real machine not a virtual machine you will get absolutely accurate information we can see this as an ethernet connection we can see a mac address here for the interface we can see 
such a thing as the maximum transmission unit. Remember, we talked about that in the previous skill. We can see we're using IPv4. And INET4 tells us our actual IP address on this interface right here. So our IP address is 192.168.0.65 with a slash 24 mask. Now, we can actually see on this interface, we have the default route configured to go out of this interface. Remember in the previous nugget I talked about we could have a default route. This is what this default route looks like. 0, .0, .0, .0, .0, slash 0. This is ultimately the dotted decimal notation indicating that default route. Now we also have some IPv6 information, but we'll just skip over that for now. So now we come to the loopback interface. I won't go into what a loopback interface is too much. It's just ultimately a logical interface that doesn't actually exist physically, but it does serve a good use. We can use it for testing purposes, so on and so forth. The next thing we can see is our DNS configuration. We can see our DNS servers we're going to be using. And it also tells us that we can actually see more information using this particular command. So how about we actually try this command then? So I'll say nm cli device show. If I hit enter now, check this out. Getting much more information right here. Now a lot of what we're actually seeing here is stuff we just talked about. Let me just highlight some of it. So we can see the name of the interface here. Again, starts with EN, tells us this is an Ethernet interface. We can confirm this with the type, which informs us it is in fact Ethernet. We can see the general hardware address. This is the MAC address of this interface, the physical address, the burnt-in one, as opposed to the logical IP address. We can see the MTU, which is 1500, the default. We see the state has the value of 100, which means it is connected. And if we actually scroll on down again, we can see this information relating to our IP address configured on this. Check this right here, the IPv4 gateway. This is the gateway address we would use if we wanted to reach a remote network. Say for example, as I often use, if we tried to ping 8.8.8.8, .8 we would actually just send that remote traffic to this IP address here. And this is going to represent our router. And again, notice that our address here, 192.168.0.65 slash 24, notice that is on the same network as the gateway. Super, super important that that is the case because it is the gateway who allows you to reach remote networks. If you try to reach a remote gateway, then you can't contact it because it's the gateway itself that allows you to make remote connections, of course. So when you happen to be managing such configurations, really make sure that your gateway is on the same address as your own interface. Check this out here. Here is our first route. Like I say, this is the default route, 0, .0, .0, .0, 0.0.0.0 0, that indicates a default route. Pretty much saying that we don't care which IP address we're going to. This means for any IP address, the next hop we want to send that to is 192.168.0.1, which is our default gateway. So just like we saw in the previous nugget for all of our traffic, send it to the default gateway. And like I say very often, on the default gateway itself, if it is a simple router, such as your home router, it too will also have a default gateway, and its next hop would be your ISP. But from the point of view of this little client, our next hop is just our default gateway. Now we can actually see some DNS information. This would be our DNS server. This is the first one we're using, and the second one would be this one right here. Notice that these are on a different network than we are on. So how on earth would we reach them? Well, we would go via our gateway. And now we can see here, this is the configuration for our loopback interface, that logical interface. Not really too much to say here, but I just want to point out that this IP address right here, this is a well-known IP address within networking, 127.0.0.1, this is going to be the IP address for your lookback in IPv4 forum. Whereas this one here, colon, colon, one, this is actually a well-known lookback address for IPv6. So realistically, if you happen to see this address, you know it's going to be a lookback address for IPv4. If you happen to see this strange looking address, this again, a lookback address for IPv6. And again, the main purpose for lookbacks is really just for 
testing purposes, testing reachability, so on and so forth. Although admittedly, it does have additional uses too. But let's not dive into that right now. What I now want to show you is if we clear the screen, as opposed to saying NMCLI dev, we can actually get a similar output, although much shorter, much more truncated, by saying NMCLI dev, and as opposed to saying show, just saying NMCLI dev, this gives us, like I say, a really short summary of the interface, the type of interface, whether it's Wi-Fi or loopback or ethernet, whether that interface is connected and the name of this connection right here. So the connection here in this case is wire connection one. Now, another really important command we want to know is NMCLI con. This is for connections, okay? So if I hit enter here, similar output and the respect that we see the name of the connection, but we're also able to see the universally unique identifier for this connection. And again, we can see the type, which is an ethernet connection and the name of that particular interface. So what I want you to now do is to take a note of the name here. In my case, it is wired connection one. Now I'm going to take that name and I'm going to manipulate this connection. I'm going to say NMCLI con, and I'm going to say down, i.e. bring this connection down. Now what I have to do is supply the name of the connection I'm targeting. So I will say wired connection one. Now I'll put this within quotation marks because there are spaces within the name here. And if I hit enter, it's telling me this is failed. This is because I happen to need super user privileges. So let me try this again. Type in my password and notice what has happened. I've actually killed my SSH session because I'm actually remotely logging in to this actual interface over SSH. And because I brought the connection down, I killed my SSH session. So what I will do is I will actually go to the actual graphical user interface for the virtual machine. And if I go up here and I go into my connections, notice my ethernet connection is gone. What I will do then is I will access the terminal directly on the machine as opposed to remotely via SSH. And I will now say NMCLI dev, check this out, the state is now disconnected for that interface because I brought it down using the NMCLI con down command. So now what I can do is I can try to bring it back up. So I will say NMCLI con up this time. And now what I'll do is I'll say wired connection one and I'll hit enter. In fact, before I even do hit enter, I'll need to use super user privileges and I'll type in my password again. And now we can see here on the right hand side, connection established, you're now connected to wired connection one. So what I could do now is I could say NMCLI dev, now our connection is back up. Now if I just wanted to completely delete the connection altogether, what I could do would be sudo NMCLI con delete. And again, type in the name and I could hit enter, type in my password, and that would completely delete the connection. For now, I don't actually want to do that, so I'll just delete this at the moment. So what I will do instead, is I will create a little test connection. Now I can do this by saying NMCLI, I will say con adds, and I will say con hyphen name, and I'll now give this connection a name. So as opposed to saying wired connection one, I'll just say wired connection 99. Okay, whatever, call it anything you choose. I'm going to specify the type of connection. It's going to be an ethernet connection. And just let me expand this a little bit, make it a little bit easier for you to see. I will give it an IPv4 address. So I'll say IP and it's not IPv4, it's just IP4, try to remember that. And I'll give it the address 192.168, I don't know, I'll just say 31.55. And then give it a slash 24 mask. I will give it its gateway address by saying gateway and it's an IPv4 address. And I'll just say 192.168.31.1 .1, and I'll give it its interface name and I'll just make this ethernet and I'll just say S23 and I'll say auto connect. And before I do this, I'll actually go and say sudo and hit enter. Oh, and I forgot the value for auto connect. So I'll just say auto connect, yes, hit enter. And now we can see here, we have successfully added a wired connection. So I'll clear the screen. If I say NMCLI con, we can actually see we have added a new connection. Now the actual interface here does not actually exist, so it's not going to come up. I'm not going to be able to use it, but I'm just trying to let you see the general syntax of what we can use here. And if I wanted, I could also edit particular settings in an interactive mode by saying NMCLI, 
con and then edit. This will drop me into an interactive mode. I can specify the type of connection I want. Say for example, a VPN connection, I could say VPN. And then I could run through the type of connections that I do want to change. But really we don't have to focus on the deep details of how to run through all of these configurations. We just want to have a basic awareness of some of the simple show commands, some of the output that it presents, the fact that we can make changes to devices and to connections using that nmcli con command and the nmcli dev command with the available arguments and options that come with those commands. And understand that because this is a command line based tool, this is really very useful for the purposes of scripting as well as when we log into devices which do not have graphical user interfaces and need their network connections modified, changed or monitored. So that really is us for now on the NMCLI tool. We still have a few more commands that we have to check out with respect to our network configurations. The next command I want to show you is the IP adder command and that is what we're going to be talking about in the very next nugget. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hey guys and welcome back. So in the previous nugget we had looked at using the network manager via the network CLI utility. Now what I want to show you is the IP adder command. So what I will just do is say man IP and we can see here with this command we can actually change things such as routing as well as information relating to our networking devices, interfaces and tunnels. So if we just keep pushing spacebar we can see examples of this command. This is the one which I primarily want to focus in on, the IP adder command, but we do have other options within the IP command, such as IP root to show the routing table, or IP link to manipulate interfaces. But like I say for now, let's just quickly focus on the IP adder command. So I'll press Q to quit. So if I actually type the command IP adder, we can see the IP address information via this command as well. Now we can see here at the top, this is this loopback interface, but down here, we can actually see our ethernet connection. Now we can see things such as the IP address here, and it tells us the broadcast address for that network. We talked about that briefly in a previous skill. And we can also see the IPv6 address. So now, if I wanted to change my IP address from this one, let's maybe change it to 0.70 instead of 0.65, what I will do is I'll use that IP adder command and what I'll now say is the add command and now what I'll do is I'll add in the IP address I want to change it to. So I'll say 192.168.0. in my case 70 and I'll do slash 24 for the slash 24 mask. Now I'll specify the device I want to target is going to be in this case this interface right here. So I'll say ENP0S3. So if I hit enter now, clearly <laughs> I need to type in super user privileges. I keep forgetting to do that. Apologies. Try that again. Type in the old password. So now if I say IP adder show ENP0S3, I have actually added an IP address now. Now this one actually still exists. We can see this. This is going to be the primary address, but I actually have added a second IP address on this interface. So let's say I wanted to remove this IP address right here. What I could do is say sudo IP adder del 192.168.0.65 slash 24 and I'll say dev and the device is ENP0S3. What is going to happen is I've actually deleted the IP address again, which I'm connecting to over SSH. So I've once again terminated my SSH session. So we can see here we have a network connection. So what I will do is I'll close this down. I'll just go back to my actual virtual machine. I'll log in directly as opposed to remotely over SSH. If I now do IP adder, if we look at ENP0S3, now the only IPv4 address I have is 192.168.0.70.0.65 has been deleted. Now check this out. We also have the IP link command and we can actually use this command to control interfaces, i.e. 
bring them up, bring them down. So what I will do is I'll say IP link and in fact I'll start off with sudo IP link and I will say set. This will allow me to set an interface up or down. So I'll say EN P0S3 which is the name of the interface. I will now say down and I'll type in my password of course. Now we can see here on the right hand side we are now disconnected. That ethernet interface has been brought down. It is no longer active. If I want to bring it back up though I can say set IP link or rather IP link set, apologize there, P0S3, and I will now say up. So if I hit enter now, it should bring the interface back up, which we can see here at the top right of the screen. Now if I say IP adder, look what actually has happened. The IP address has reverted back to being 0. 0.65. That is because when we happen to make these changes via the IP adder command, they're actually not going to be persistent. So if you want to be able to make such changes persistent, you would actually have to modify the Etsy network interfaces file. Now if you actually don't have this file on your system, you could create it and you could actually put in your IP address configurations there. But moving on, I also just quickly want to show you a command that we can use to change our host name. So if I just say host name right now, we can see the host name as IPv0. We actually have this command called hostname ctl. So what I can do is hostname ctl set hyphen hostname and then give this a new hostname such as cbtn. If I hit enter, notice it appears that nothing has actually happened. But if I say hostname, it does tell me that cbtn is the new hostname. But look at the actual prompt right here. It's still IPv0 at IPv0. So what I'll do is I'll close down the terminal. And if I go and reopen a new terminal, notice that the actual host name has now also been updated within the prompt itself. So within this nugget, I just wanted to introduce you to the IP command. We had the IP adder option, the IP link option, as well as some other options we didn't explore, but those are the main ones. And I also wanted to show you the hostname CTL command. This is another command we have to be aware of for the LPIC1 examinations when making configuration changes to our system. But lastly, to close off this skill, one thing I want to show you are some legacy commands. That is what we're going to be talking about in the very next nuggets. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hey guys and welcome back. So now what I want to quickly show you are some of the legacy commands that we could use to manipulate our system. So if I say sudo apt install net hyphen tools and hit enter, this is going to begin installing net tools which will give us access to these legacy commands. Okay, so the first command I will show you is the root command. This is going to show us our routing table. So we can see here we have our own network within our routing table and we have our default route exiting this interface. Now, just like we saw with the IP adder command, we can see we have our address here, 192.168.0.65. We can actually see our IP address information with this other command called ifconfig. If I hit enter now, look at this. We can see the interface information for our ethernet, such as our IPv4 address, our net mask, the broadcast address for this network. We can see the MAC address of this interface, as well as a whole bunch of interface statistics. Similarly, we can also see our loopback interface. Now, just like with the IP adder command, we can also change our IP address configuration. So what I'll actually do here, I will say sudo ifconfig and I will type in the name of the interface, which is ENP0S3. And what I will do is I'll just change this to 192.168.0.99 and I'll make it a slash 24 mask or alternatively, I could actually type the command netmask 255.255.255.0. Both of these are acceptable. So if I hit enter now, and I say ifconfig, notice that the IP address has now been changed. And like we can with the IP link command, we can bring interfaces down. Using ifconfig, we can do the same type of thing. We can say sudo ifconfig, give the interface name, and then say down. 
And what this will now do is pull down the interface as we can see here at the top right. Similarly, we can say sudo if config en p0 s3 up. And now it brings it back up. So the type of things that we can do with the IP command now, IP adder, IP link, IP root, we used to be able to do it with these legacy commands such as ifconfig and the root command. So really just being aware that we do have these old school commands that are still sometimes in use depending on the system. But also being aware of the newer commands, getting familiar with both of these is really going to be helpful when it comes to setting your LPIC1 examination. Okay doc, so that is us for now. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hey guys and welcome back. So in the previous nugget we happened to talk about some of the networking commands that we could use to well modify our system networking. So what we're going to be doing on this skill or rather within this skill is building on some of the knowledge that we have just previously acquired and also take that knowledge so that we can begin doing some troubleshooting. So really some of the things we will be looking at, we will look at some of our commands that we have previously seen before so we can manipulate our interfaces and we will also be looking at testing connectivity. So we'll get to see commands such as ping as well as a super cool command called traceroute. And not just this, we will also be looking at tools such as netstat and netcat, both of which are very, very valuable. And we will be looking at even more things beyond this. So what I'm saying is that we do have a lot of cool things to cover within this skill. How about we roll up our sleeves and just dig right in then. Now the very first thing that I want to talk to you about is basically following along from the previous skill. We're going to be using some particular commands that we can use to modify our interface configurations. And we will talk about this from the point of view of problem solving. So let's dive in and check this out then, shall we? Okay, so if you are following along from the previous skill, you should already have this installed, but if you haven't, go and install NetTools. Type in the old password. As we can see, I already have this. Okay. So let's imagine a simple scenario. Let's say we have our little Ubuntu machine right here. And let's say you are trying to remotely log in as I'm doing right now over something like say SSH. But for whatever reason, the connection was not working. We couldn't actually connect to this machine. Now, if we actually had direct console access to this machine, i.e. local access, one of the first things that we would want to do to troubleshoot such an issue would be to check some of the basic network connectivity options. Now, we will be looking at other tools that we could certainly use within this type of example, things such as the ping command. But for now, one of the things I could do on the local machine is to make sure that the machine does in fact have an IP address and the actual interface where you have that IP address is in the up state. So check this out then, I'll go to the local machine. Now, from the previous skill, we learned we had two different commands we could use to inspect this type of information. The first one was the more old school command, the ifconfig. And the first thing, like I say, when issuing this command is we would be checking to ensure we actually have this inet value, an internet address. And we would want to make sure that this internet address actually matches the one we are trying to log into. So say for example, I open up my putty session. We can see here, this is indeed the IP address I'm trying to reach. So it should make sense, therefore, that this IP address is present on the target machine. So we can see it here, 192.168.0.65. If for some reason I just could not get a connection to this, say for example, I'll actually do the wrong port and I get this type of error. Now it so happens, I know the issue happens to be the wrong port. But if this was not immediately obvious to me, one of the first things I would check would be that IP address. So like I say, we could do the ifconfig command check that address and therefore we could rule out the address being an issue because the address is in fact correct and we could then proceed on to testing the next 
possible cause of the connectivity issue, which in my case here, I've obviously used the wrong ports. And this is often the kind of troubleshooting methodology you will be using. You will check things in a very consistent manner and just gradually eliminate potential causes systematically. Similarly, if I happen to do ifconfig, and I did ENP0S3 down, in fact, of course, I would need to use the super user privileges and type in my passwords. Now, if I say ifconfig, notice we actually do not have the Ethernet interface I was connecting to. So now if I went back and tried to log in remotely, again, I go to putty, I have the correct port, and I'm going to try to log into this IP address. Of course, it's going to fail because as we know, we just shut down the interface. So one thing, again, we have to be aware of is to make sure that the interface we are trying to connect to is up and the way we can do this is by using this ifconfig command. I'll do ENP0S3 and then up and I'll do ifconfig once again. Notice right now I actually don't have an IPv4 address quite just yet and it seems like there happens to be some type of issue getting this DHCP request. So even now even though the interface is in the up state, which we can see here, no longer do we have that IP address. So what I therefore could do is if necessary, I could, as we saw before, I could actually manually do this by saying ENP0S3, that is the interface name, and then add on that IP address. I'll say 192.168 and I'll give it 0 0.65 with the net mask of 255.255.255.0, which is a slash 24, as we do know. If I hit enter, I do an IF config. This is now back up. Go back to putty, try to open my connection, log in as IPv0, and now we have solved the problem. IF config, we can see the IP address is present again. Simple, simple connectivity checks. Make sure the interface has an IP address, and the IP address that you're trying to target actually matches the one you see in the output of the IF config command. Now, like I say, we happen to be using ifconfig, which is the deprecated command. We could do the exact same things using the IP link command or the IP adder command. Now, like I say, we can do the same type of diagnostics with the command IP adder. We can see that we have our IP address. We would check that the interface is in the upstate. The exact same type of things that we did with the ifconfig command. It's just more the methodology we are trying to focus in on. Checking interfaces are being up checking they do have the correct IP addresses that are being targeted for connectivity and if required, modifying those IP addresses to match the ones we need. Now say for example, you wanted to perhaps connect over IP6 or IPv6, should I say, we could use the ifconfig command or we could, of course, use the IP command because it's pseudo IP dash six address and now we could just add in a particular ipv6 address i'll just say 2001 db8 colon colon one slash 64 this happens to be a shortened ipv6 address but it is a valid one and i'll say dev and i'll put this on en p0 s3 if i hit enter type in my password oh and it appears i've forgotten the add command so that should be add apologies there hit enter if i now do ip adder Notice we also have added an IPv6 address to this interface here. So same type of deal, whether we're using ifconfig or the IP command. So these commands are really, really crucial when it comes to basic first checks with respect to your network connectivity. With the IP command or the ifconfig command, we can check our interfaces are up or down, which is obviously crucial for connectivity as well as we can verify our IP address information as we saw before. And if required, we can change or modify our IP address to the required address that we need. And we can do that whether this is IPv4 or IPv6. So really that was just a brief recap of what we learned with respect to the ifconfig command and the IP command and now applying that knowledge to a simple little scenario based example of losing connectivity and utilizing these commands in a real world way. Now what I want to explore is the ping command. This is a very, very important tool with respect to testing our IP connectivity. And that's what we're gonna be talking about in the very next nuggets. So I hope this has been informative for you. And I'd like to thank you for viewing.
Hey guys and welcome back. So in the previous nugget we had talked about some of the basic networking commands that we had used but this time we tried to focus on some simple application that we could use these commands to solve some problems. Now one of the key things that we will use for troubleshooting is this command called ping. Now we briefly have seen this command before but we want to look at it in a little bit more detail. Now, one of the very first things that I want to talk to you about before we actually begin using this command relates to the concept of what is called the TTL, because this is something we will actually see within the output of the ping command. Therefore, I do think it does make sense that we actually understand what this concept is all about. So check it out then, okay? Let's imagine we had a simple network here. We've got a router here. And let's imagine that it was connected to another router. And then once again, it was connected to yet another router. And let's have one out here as well, okay? So for the purposes of this, we'll call this R1, R2, R3, and R4, the fourth router. So let's imagine that R1 wanted to talk to R4. Now it actually could have two different paths. It could go this way and then reach R4 directly via R3, or alternatively, depending on the speed of this link, maybe this link here and this link here is actually a much faster connection than this wire. So even though it would take an extra hop, it could also go this path. Not a problem and not a big deal. What I want to highlight to you is that see this connectivity, such as being able to move a packet up to here and then down here and then across to the target. This is routing in action. Now we talked about routing briefly and we understood that we can use things such as routing protocols, but what can actually happen with respect to routing is we can actually get routing loops. And this is actually a very big problem within routing. It's something we have to design into our protocols to prevent this action or at least mitigate it as best we can. But a routing loop could look something like say, R1 passes it to R2 and R2 passes it to R3. And let's say R3 happens to have some type of strange misconfiguration. And what it does it actually sends the packet back to R1. And R1 says, well, the best path is R2. It sends it again, R2 sends it here. R3 misconfigures, sends it back round, and this can just keep happening over and over and over and over again. So clearly, this is a big problem. This would ultimately just cause a great amount of congestion within the network, not to mention it's completely inefficient because the packet is not going where it is destined to go or where we hope it is destined to go. Now, the cool thing here is that we actually do have a solution to stop this type of behavior, and this is called the TTL. This is what I just want to briefly talk to you about. What the TTL stands for, it stands for the time to live. And it's pretty much how long a packet should live before it dies out. So what might happen here is that the packet, when it begins at R1, is going to have a TTL value. Now the value may actually change depending on the particular application. It may be something like say, 128, it may be something like say 64, but let's just say it was 64. Let me talk to you about how this is going to work. Now, when this packet is crafted right here, it's going to have a TTL of 64. Now, when R1 sends the packet off, let's say it goes via R2, what R2 is going to do is going to decrement the TTL. So therefore, it's going to modify this and make the new TTL 63 okay and then r2 will send it to r3 and then when we get to another router the next router again is going to decrement that value so 63 minus 1 the new ttl will be 62. now perhaps you can see the advantage of what is actually happening here because if this device sends it the wrong way and the packet comes back to r1 r1 is again going to decrement the ttl so that would knock it from, I think it was 62 over here. Now R1 would make it 61 and then pass it on to R2, which would make it 60 and then 59 and then 58. Oh, can I mash my drawing pad there? 58, 57, you get the drift. What is happening is we ultimately have a countdown. Now the good thing here with this countdown 
is that when this time to live value hits zero, the packet is just going to be dropped and it is no longer going to be passed around within the network. That means if we happen to get ourselves into this case whereby we have some type of loop going here to here to here and back round and round and round, eventually the packet will have its TTL decrement to zero and this behavior will stop and the loop will stop. So this really is one of the big advantages with TTL. Now, like I say, this actual TTL value is in the output of the ping command. So I just really wanted to highlight and focus what this concept is so that you can actually make sense of it when we look at the output of the ping command when we go to try it. So now that we actually have this concept under our belt, let's dive in and begin looking at this ping command then. So the first thing, as I always recommend, is I'm going to go into the man page. So I will say man ping and then hit enter. Now, we can see here, this is the ping command. And what it's going to do, it's going to send ICMP echo requests. So remember that the ping command uses ICMP. We actually talked about this protocol before. It is the internet control message protocol. And the ICMP protocol has this concept of an echo request. Now, when we go to use this ping command, we have a bunch of different options. We can use the dash four to just have IPv4 pings. We can do dash six for IPv6. We can do dash eight if we actually want to hear the ping itself. And if we scroll on down, this one here, the dash C, this is a very useful one I tend to find. This allows us to specify just how many ping messages we want to send. Because by default, when you happen to use the ping command on a Linux machine, it's just going to keep repeatedly pinging that target until you terminate the program. So if you actually use the dash C command, you can give a predefined number of pings that you actually want to send. This is something I use all the time. Similarly, we have the option for dash B to allow us to ping the broadcast address. Now this can be a useful thing to do, but it can also be a dangerous thing to do. In fact, this is why this switch does exist. If you just happen to ping a broadcast address by itself, it's not going to be allowed. This is why you have to explicitly say it with the dash B flag. That is because you can actually crash a network by pinging the broadcast address. And in fact, this happens to be an attack that malicious attackers sometimes use. So this option is here, but you really should only be using it in very particular circumstances. Now, another one which I happen to use quite a lot is this option right here, the I option, which allows us to send or rather to change the interval of the ping ICMP messages we send. The default is one second, so we will send one ping, then wait a second, send the next, wait a second, send the next. If we want to say, for example, shorten that interval, we would use the dash I flag, but notice if we want to shorten the interval below 0.2 seconds, we have to have super user privileges. A regular user cannot do this again. This is because you can ultimately overwhelm a system by sending far too many pings in short succession. Now we also have many more options within the man page right here. As we can see here, we can actually set our own time to live value if we so choose. But for now, how about we dive in and begin using the ping command? So I will press Q to quit. And if I do IP adder, I can see my IP address right here. Let me just ping my own IP address. I'll say ping. 192.168.0.65 and if I hit enter, check this out. If I press control Z, this will terminate the ping. But look at this actual output here. We actually see we are getting a response, 64 bytes, from this IP address and we can see it is an ICMP message. We see the sequence. This is the first one sent, the second one sent, the third. We can see the time to live value is 64. This actually gives us an idea of where it is in the network this device happens to be pinged. Now this happens to be starting at the value of 64 and it hasn't decremented because the value will only decrement when it goes to another router. And over here we can see the actual time it took to get the response. So a little variation that is very, very expected and common. So if I wanted to ping with a limited amount, I could do ping dash C 
and then let's maybe just say five pings and then I can do my target address. Let's do 192.168.0.1 and if I hit enter, there's only going to be five pings before the program terminates itself like it just has and we can see here at the end we actually have the ping statistics. We can see we sent five packets, five were received, absolutely none of them were lost, so all of them hit their targets, and we have our time right here. Now, like I say, if I wanted to send these in a quicker succession, what I could do is do C5 for the count, and I could do dash I to change the interval to maybe say 0 0.3 seconds, then type in the IP address. If I hit enter, they're going to send them much quicker like you just saw there. And similarly, if I try to go below 0.2 and do 0.1, I'm going to need super user privileges. So what I will do here is I will just say sudo ping, then hit enter. Once I type in my passwords and hit enter, they're going to be sent really, really fast as you saw right there. Now here is a very common strategy in use when using ping. Let's say that we have our local PC right here. And then we have our little router, which is going to be our default gateway. And we want to try to ping a remote server. Let's just maybe say Google, which we will say is 8.8.8.8. So let's say you try to visit Google via your web browser, but you actually couldn't get access. But you knew this was the correct IP address. You did an NS lookup or you used the dig command or whatever it may be. And you wanted to try to ping this IP address to see if it was reachable. Here is the common scenario you would do to troubleshoot this problem. You could first try to ping the remote server. And if that failed, i.e. you couldn't ping this address, you would then try to ping your default gateway. And then you would try to ping your own IP address. And then you would try to ping your own loopback address. And depending on what your results were, following this process, that would give you a lot of insight into what was going on. Say for example, here we are here, let's just say it's our PC, router, and this can be Google that we're trying to ping. If we can actually ping the remote network, well, we don't actually have a problem with IP reachability. So therefore, if you actually can't browse to Google, maybe the actual port which it uses, i.e. port 80 or port 443, maybe that is blocked by a firewall or something. It's not actually an IP connectivity issue. But let's say when following this methodology, you could not ping the remote server with Google, but you could ping your default gateway. So you can ping to here, but you cannot ping to here. Well, that would mean that at least your local settings are correct. You would know that's fine. And that your default gateway is reachable, but perhaps there maybe is a problem on the default gateway itself, because this is where the communication is breaking down. Maybe there is no root in the default gateway's routing table to get to this particular address. So then you would begin focusing your attention on this device right here. However, let's say you could not ping the remote network, so you try to ping the default gateway, and you also can't ping the default gateway either. Then you could strongly assume that perhaps the actual problem lies on your device, and maybe indeed that the routing table here is fine and the server is actually perfectly reachable. And likewise, if you were not able to ping the remote server, not able to ping the default gateway, and you were actually not able to ping your local IP address, you could therefore deduce that something is wrong on your device, i.e. maybe you're actually using the wrong IP address, or maybe your interface is down. Just like we talked about in the previous nugget, we could check that with the IP adder command or the IP link command or IF config. And then lastly, if we couldn't even ping our loopback, there might actually be a problem with the TCP IP stack itself because the loopback should always be up and should always be pingable. So depending on what you actually can ping following this methodology, you can quickly triangulate where you should actually focus your attention. So just to follow this methodology so you can see it in action. So I could try to ping a remote network, say for example, 8.8.8.8, .8 and I do have connectivity. So if I can ping a remote network, I know that my default gateway configuration is fine. I know that my local IP configuration is fine and I know my TCP IP stack is working. 
So by being able to ping the remote network, that actually gives us good insight into our own local network. But again, assume that this actually failed. What I could then do is I could issue the command IP root and I can see my default gateway configuration is 192.168.0.1. So therefore, I would want to ping this address. Again, this is going to work because my configuration happens to be fine. But as we can see here, this would be the next step we would take. And if this happened to fail, what I would do is do my IP adder, try to ping my local IP address. And I would do ping 192.168.0.65. And again, this happens to be working. But if this did fail, the last thing I would do would be to ping my loopback. Now we can actually see here the loopback address. This, as I've said before, is a very well known lookback IP address for IPv4, 127.0.0.1, try to remember that. So we could ping 127.0.0.1, and as we can see, our TCP IP stack is working quite the thing. Now one thing I will say, is that we can do the same thing with IPv6. I could do IP-6 adder, so we can see our IPv6 addresses, and this one happens to be a very well known lookback IPv6 address, colon, colon, one. And we can actually ping this by saying ping minus six colon colon one. And we can actually see here, we can successfully ping that address. So if we so chose, we could follow the same methodology, ping the IPv6 address of a remote network, then the IPv6 address of our default gateway, then our own IPv6 address on the interface. And then as we saw there, lastly, pinging the IPv6 loopback address. Now just for posterity, if I happen to ping an address which I can't reach, i.e. maybe one that is not actually configured, such as this one right here, what is going to happen is, this is just going to tell us that the destination host is unreachable. So if I press Control Z, or if I prefer to put an actual count on it, say for example C5, if I hit enter, this is the type of output that we're going to see when we do not have connectivity in this case here, we have 100% packet loss. So as we can see here, the ping command is such a big command for networking troubleshooting. And following that methodology of pinging remote servers, then our default gateway, then our own interface followed by our own loopback addresses, whether it's for IPv4 or IPv6, this will go a long way to helping you diagnose your networking problems. So that is us for our introduction into the ping command. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hey guys, and welcome back. So in the previous nugget, we had just talked about how we could use the ping command to ultimately help us diagnose connectivity issues on our network. Now what we're going to be exploring is one of my absolute favorite commands, and this is one called traceroute. Now traceroute happens to be a deprecated command, so we do have to make sure it is installed. But as you're going to see here, there actually are some more modern implementations that offer the same type of functionality. But before we begin, let me talk to you about the concept of what Traceroute is all about. And it actually relates to the TTL, which is why I actually did spend a little bit of time talking about what this actually is, because I knew it was going to be relevant in an upcoming nugget, i.e. this one right here. So let's dive in then, shall we? So again, let's talk about this right here. Let's imagine we have our little PC here. This can be our Linux Ubuntu machine. And let's say we are connected to a router here. And let's just imagine there's another router up here and another router here. And let's say one here and one here, okay? So this can be router one, which will be our default gateway. Let's call this one router two, three, four, and five. So again, let's say we want to ping from our PC all the way over to router five. And we go in and let's just imagine, say for example, this has got the IP address of 5.5.5.5 to keep things simple. So we go on to our terminal and we actually type the command ping 5.5.5.5. And we actually get a good response. It transpires that we have 100% success rate and none of our packets were dropped. So we know that we are actually able to ultimately reach 
this device from our Ubuntu machine. But here is a question for you, how would you know which path it actually took? So here's what I'm saying here. So the PC would have went to R1 straight away because this is the default gateway. We know this move is going to happen. But do we go left or do we go right, so to speak? I.e. did we go up via router 2 and then to router 4 and then to router 5? Was that the path we took? Or alternatively, maybe we went from our default gateway down to router 3 instead and then router 4 and then router 5? Because with the ping command, all we are able to deduce is that we do have connectivity with this device, but not how we actually got to that device. Now this is where Traceroute is actually going to tell us the exact information that we are looking for right here. And the way it's going to be able to do this is by a very clever use of the TTL. So let's see how this is going to actually shake out then. When we happen to use the Traceroute command on our PC, we are going to send a very specific series of packets. Now the very first packet is going to be crafted with a TTL of 1. Now the reason why this is, is because when the PC actually sends it to the default gateway with a TTL of 1, what will the router do? The router will actually decrement the TTL, so it'll minus 1 off it, now the TTL is zero, so as opposed to passing on this packet, what this router here is going to do, it's going to say, hey, the TTL has been exceeded, and it's going to drop that packet, and it's going to send a message back to the PC, pretty much saying, hey, the TTL was exceeded. Now the cool thing about this is that this device here is going to list its source address when it actually sends this message back to the PC. So ultimately, when the PC gets this back, it knows the first packet it sent with a TTL of 1 got a message from a particular IP address. Say for example, the default gateway was 1.1.1.1. So that would mean that this PC would know the very first hop was 1.1.1.1, i.e. this device here. Okay, so now the PC then sends a second packet, again for the same destination of 5.5.5.5, but it only gives a TTL of 2, so it increments it the next time. So we send that to this device here, it sees a TTL of 2, and it minuses 1 off it, and then this device here is going to send that packet off to the next hop. So let's just say, for example, the path it was actually taking was via R3. The new TTL would be 1, and R1 would send this off to R3. Now, R3 would see the TTL of 1, try to minus 1, and see the TTL as 0. And then this device here would now send a TTL exceeded message of its own. And what is it going to do within this message? It's going to send its own source address with this message. So let's just imagine this device here had the address 3.3.3.3. .3 now, this message would be relayed back all the way back to the PC with this new TTL. So we know the first packet we sent went to 1.1.1.1. And then we know the next one we sent went to 3.3.3.3. .3 .3 .3. Can you see where this is going? So again, we run the same scenario. The device then crafts another packet. This time the TTL is set to the value of three. So we send it to this one. We have three minus one, it becomes two. This one sends it off to number three. It does two minus one, which equals one, and then sends it off to the next hop. So R4 gets it, sees the TTL as one, minus is one off it and goes, by the way, TTL exceeded. I need to send a message back with my source address, in this case here, let's just call this the address of 4.4.4.4. And now this message gets relayed all the way back to the PC again. So we're actually tracing the path here. The first time the TTL exceeded came from 1.1.1.1. And then it came from 3.3.3.3, .3 and then it came from 4.4.4.4, and then eventually we will actually hit 5.5.5.5. .5 and now we can actually build up the path that the packet is actually taking. We know that it's taking this lower path via R3 as opposed to going over R2. So this TTL isn't just useful for actually preventing loops, it allows us to trace our path within the network quite easily. 
So this can be very useful for diagnostic purposes to maybe see whereabouts traffic is breaking down in your network. So, like I say, the actual traceroute command itself, this is deprecated. We now have newer implementations. So if you try to say traceroute and give an IP address, it's going to say here that the traceroute command is not installed. So I'll just say sudo apt install traceroute, type in my password, and now I can actually find the path to a particular IP address. So if I say traceroute 8.8.8.8, we can actually see here the hops that was taken. Now, sometimes you may actually see these stars. This means that the server did not respond as expected. This very often happens when you're traversing the global internet. But if you happen to be doing this over your own internal network, which may be large, you can configure it so that you can see a detailed path. But right now, I can see many of the IP addresses which I am traversing to get all the way to 8.8.8.8, .8 even if I'm not getting the absolute full path. Now, as you can see here, I'm typing in the IP address, but I can also actually type in the name of the URL. So if I say traceroute twitter.com, hit enter, we can see here many of the IP addresses on the path, and I can see it actually took 10 hops to get there, i.e. it went through 10 different routers to route that traffic from me to twitter.com. Now, like I always recommend, I suggest you go into the traceroute man page, and we can use things such as traceroute 6 to be able to see IPv6 information. We can also specify our own maximum TTLs if we so choose, and a whole bunch of other information. So lots of detail right here. Now a newer command which does a similar thing is one called trace path. As we can see here, in the man page, we have many different options that we can use. And if I just happen to use tracepathtwitter.com, we can actually see similar information. We can see we're taking 10 hops. We can see many of these destinations we're going through. Some are giving us actual IP addresses. Some are giving us fully qualified domain names. We can actually see the time of the responses. And like I say, sometimes we're going to see on the public internet, some servers not configured to give us the relevant information. But in a network, perhaps that you completely control, even a very, very large network with hundreds or thousands of devices, you can use this command to get super detailed information about the paths that your packets are taking within your network. And like I say, this is very, very good for being able to identify what routers are doing with packets, the decisions they are making, as well as being able to locate where some connectivity is breaking down. Say, for example, you might not be able to reach a destination, but the trace route might actually reveal you're getting halfway there before the connection is breaking down. In which case, you've got a good starting point to begin troubleshooting that problem. So that really is us for our introduction into the trace route command, or now the trace path command. We still have another few tools we want to be checking out. The next one we're going to be looking at is the netstat command, and that is what we're going to be doing in the very next nugget. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hey guys, and welcome back. So what we're going to be talking about in this nugget right here are the commands netstat and netcat. So let's first begin with the netstat command. So what we'll do is I'll say man netstat, and it tells us here this is going to allow us to print our network connections, routing tables, interface statistics, as well as a few other things. So this is actually a very, very powerful command that allows us to see a lot of information about what is going on with respect to our network. Now, if you scroll on down, we can see we have many different switches. We can do dash dash root or dash r to display the kernel routing tables. We can do dash i to get information relating to our network interfaces or dash s for summary statistics. And if you scroll on down, there's even more options available yet again. So what I'm now going to do is just press Q and let me give you a brief example of how to use this then. So we can just say netstat minus r. And what this is going to do, as we can see here, gives us our kernel IP routing table. So this is similar to information we have seen before. But understand, netstat does give us the ability to retrieve this IP routing table information as well. But what we can also do is, say for example, 
use a command like netstat and then do dash A for all connections, then T for TCP connections and then P to give us the program name and process ID. If I hit enter now, check this out, we can actually see a whole bunch of information relating to connections on our PC. So we can see we have TCP, this is our local host and it is in the listening state. And we can actually see here connections I had previously made using the NC command. This is going to be netcat, which we'll see very, very shortly within this very nugget. So we actually have a record here of connections that were coming from my computer or coming into my computer. So this is actually very handy if someone happened to hack your device and they were remotely logging in and doing things maliciously. Running Netstat, you could actually maybe see the connection that they had coming into your machine. So this can be a very good diagnostic tool for a whole host of different reasons, from the mundane to maybe the more dramatic if you're getting hacked. So I will do a trick I have shown you before. I'm going to install the Python programming language, which I already have installed. And I will just say sudo python3m for the module, and I will say HTTP server and I will have connections listening in on maybe say port 8080, okay? So now we're actually serving HTTP connections over 8080. Now whilst I leave this running, I'll actually go directly onto my machine here. Okay, so we go here, and if I happen to say netstat ANO, this is going to give me a whole bunch of information. What I can now do though, is if I actually grep for the port 8080, which I just opened, you can actually see this connection is open. Basically, my computer is listening on port 8080 for connections. You see that? Now, the netstat command actually has been deprecated and now the newer one is SS. This is named after socket statistics. And as we can see here, it gives us similar information to netstat. So we can see here we have our many different options. If you scroll on down, you can go through all these options, of course. But right now, I'll just press Q and let me show you a basic use case. I can say SS gives me a whole ton of information here. I can scroll through all of this and, of course, I could get through it if I so choose. But I can also do the same type of commands I was doing. So I can say SS ANO gives me a whole ton. Again, we can grep for 8080. Similar to what we saw before, we can see we actually have TCP listening for port 8080. So these two tools, Netstat and the newer SS, super valuable to be able to inspect the actual network connections happening on our system. Now, another command I want to talk to you about is called netcat. What I'll do is I'll say man nc. Now this command, as it says here, NC or netcat use for just about anything under the sun involving TCP, UDP or Unix domain sockets. This is very true. What you can do with this command is honestly kind of bonkers and it's far more than I can cover in a short video. But we can see here some of the things it can do. Let me show you some examples we can use with netcat. So what I could do is I could actually use netcat to open up a socket. I'll say NC which is netcat, listen on port, and I'll just give it a port, I'll just say 4444. So if I hit enter, this is now listening here. So what I can actually do is I'll just open up another terminal right here, and I will say netstat, ATOP, I'll full screen this. We can actually see the port is indeed listening. Now when we happen to see this value here, 0000, 000, 000 on port 444, that just means it's listening on all our local IP addresses on this particular port. And by the way, notice you can actually see the SSH session for my putty that I've also been using, which is this session right here. So all these open connections easily identifiable using netstat. But again, to keep the focus on netcat, notice how we were easily able to open up a connection. So what I actually want to do here is if I minimize this and I'll go to my virtual machine. I'll also start up my Rocky Linux. Okay, so my Rocky Linux is now booting up. Okay, so I've now logged in. What I want to do is say sudo yum update. Type in my password and this will begin updating. I will say y for yes and I'll now say sudo yum install nc and I'll now say y hit enter and now I shall have netcat on this machine. 
So what I first want to do is to be able to check I have connectivity with my Zubuntu machine. So I'll ping 192.168.0.65 and we do have connectivity. Now what I want to do is to try to establish a connection with that machine since it is listening on port 4444. So what I'll do is I will say NC 192.168.0.65 and then a space and then the port number. So 44. 4, 4. If I hit enter, we should now have established a connection. So if I type some message and say, this is just a message and hit enter, look on the right hand side on the Ubuntu machine, we have actually received that message. So if I go to my Ubuntu machine and I say, so it is and hit enter, look at the left hand side here. We have basically just set up a really simple instant chat messenger. So I can say, hey, how long has the network been acting weird? Hit enter. We can see it on the right hand side. And on the left hand side, the person managing the Ubuntu machine could say, no idea. I just got here and it was already broken. If I hit return, look at the left hand side, we can actually see the exchange going on. Now this is just an absolute slither of what you can actually do with the netcat command. Like I say, it can be used for pretty much everything under the sun with respect to socket connections. But these commands, the netstat command and the netcat command are absolutely vital when it comes to networking configurations on your Linux system. And this is why you really want to be able to understand them as a Linux engineer. Okay, doc, so that is us for our introduction into netcat and the netstat command as well as the newer SS command. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.